and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 9th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 10 degrees in Smith Falls, 14. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Flags at all city buildings in Ottawa will fly at half-mast until a funeral is held for Prince Philip. The Queen's husband of more than 70 years died. A statement from Buckingham Palace says he died peacefully. Philip spent a month in hospital and was released just on March 16th. He returned to Windsor Castle then. Tom Rivers tells us this morning the royal couple married in 1947. Princess Anne is widely acknowledged to have been particularly close to her father, he had a difficult relationship with his first child, Prince Charles. He was also well known for making the Queen laugh and sometimes getting into trouble for his indiscreet or irreverent sense of humor. The British public loved him for these gaffes. Now, Philip flew jet planes. He piloted his own choppers as well. It was a radical break from royal tradition. In fact, on a 1962 tour of Latin America, he piloted his own jet aircraft for much of the way. Now, Prince Philip was described by the Queen as her rock, her strength, and stay. In a speech broadcast on Sky News back in November of 1997, Philip said his marriage was very successful. It's been a, a challenge for us, but by trial and experience, I believe we have achieved a sensible division of labour and a good balance between our individual and joint interests. Of course, after 50 years of experience, I find... It is a great temptation to give advice. <laughs> Philip was known for his occasional racist and sexist remarks as well. He fulfilled more than 20,000 royal engagements to boost British interests, both at home and abroad. Prince Philip dead this morning at the age of 99. City News Time, 9.02, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Clouds will increase through the day, but another very warm day for us, a high 22 degrees. Tonight, mainly cloudy and 10, and tomorrow up to 24, sun and cloud. For Sunday, windy with rain showers, not quite as warm, but still well above average, the high 18. For today, the high 22. And right now in Ottawa, 10 degrees. In Smiths Falls, it's 14. Premier Doug Ford will be receiving his COVID-19 vaccine today. Scheduled to receive the AstraZeneca shot at a pharmacy in Etobicoke. He will become the latest politician in Canada and around the world to publicly be vaccinated. Ontario's Health Minister Christine Elliott received her shot publicly last month in a bid to combat some hesitancy among some. The city is confirming an OC Transpo operator has tested positive for COVID-19. This employee last worked on Monday, has been self-isolating since then. Routes the operator was on, Route 7 in the afternoon of April 3rd between Saint and Carleton. On April 5th, the operator drove a variety of routes, including the 82, 83, 11, 264, 268 and 57. They're working to get a full list of those routes. Uh, we're doing that up on our website, ottawa.citynews.ca. Now, four schools in the Upper Canada District Board have told parents and students about confirmed COVID cases. Leeds Grenville Lanark says one person at Caldwell Street Public in Carleton Place is positive. Also a case of at Pleasant Corners Public in Van Cleek Hill and Emers Corners in Cornwall. Bridgewood Public, also in Cornwall, an outbreak declared there at least two people testing positive in that building. At least one case there involved possible transmission at school or on a school bus. That school has been closed since Wednesday. StatsCan says the economy added 303,000 jobs in March. Employment increased gains in sectors hardest hit by public health restrictions. The national unemployment rate has now dropped to 7.5%. I'm Andrew Boyle. For News Anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Separating headlines from hearsay. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Uh, Friday. We made it. Weekend looks just fine, particularly tomorrow, downright summery. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Great program ahead for you to end the week. All my Friday friends are stopping by, including the legendary Lowell Green. 
Pierre Bork of Bork News Watch will uh, wrap up this very event-filled week in the news business. Uh, Steve Warren of the Sens Nation podcast and the Steve Warren project on the Senators' ongoing woes versus the Edmonton Oilers, and it is Masters Weekend. Queen's Park Week in Review should be a hot one this week with our MPPs. What do you think, given all the news about stay-at-home orders and vaccines in freezers and the ongoing controversy about paid sick days? Uh, Doug Ford is taking more heat for that again. Bill Robson is going to be back on our show. He was here uh, just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. He is with the C.D. Howe Institute, and the C.D. Howe Institute, big think tank, is is out with uh, a report about the upcoming federal budget with some recommendations, recommending against big government, big spending dreams which we know are being planned by the Trudeau Liberals right now, worried about the growing bill left over after COVID is gone once and for all. How are we ever going to pay for it, the C.D. Howe Institute asks, and um, then recommends that we raise the GST. The GST. Has there ever been a more political tax than the GST? Oh, maybe carbon taxes. Maybe carbon taxes. Uh, we've been paying the GST now for 30 years. It used to be uh, used to be 7%. Harper lowered it twice. Uh, first to 6%, then down to 5%. Uh, Bill Robson and company, uh, including Don Drummond, by the way, also a, a co-author of this report. They're, they're, they're advising Justin Trudeau and Christopher Freeland, abandon all your big spending dreams, okay? Pharmacare, child care, all your big spending dreams. Do not spend another $100 billion to uh, build back better and raise the GST up to 7% because they say the outlook, the long-term economic prospects for Canada are quote-unquote bleak, bleak. Oh, my goodness, a bleak outlook for Canada. That interview is coming up at 945. Bill Robson, C.D. Howe Institute. Don't miss that interview. It's very important. Big names involved in putting that report together from that think tank. You are in the middle of it all. Always during the Rob Snow Show, we do the talk back hour. And uh, on Fridays, we do something called the Friday free for all. So uh, that means you come up with the topics. We don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics. And within reason, we're open to getting into just about any topic that might be on your mind. We do that between 10 and 11 o'clock this morning. It's usually a lot of fun. It can be quite adventurous. 750 is our call in line. 750 Email the Rob Snow Show at ottawa.citynews.ca. And um, while we don't come up with the topics, we, we, we generally like to stick with things that are in the news or things that you think should be in the news. That's kind of how we roll. For example, you know, this is in the news today. You know, there's this move on the left to defund the police. We're going to defund the police. Well, how about, how about this? We just maybe um, defund the police station. How about, how, about, how about that for a start? There is a story uh, in the Post Media Papers this morning from John Willing of The Citizen that the price tag for a new police station in the south end of Ottawa is on pace to cost... I couldn't believe it when I read it. Almost $120 million. $120 million. For one police station for the Ottawa Police Service. So, does, does that seem, I don't know, but it does seem a little bit maybe on the high side for one police station. I'm just asking for a friend. $120 million. Does it say Trump on the front of it? Crazy, $120 million for one police station. Uh, vaccines by postal code. First, a word of this, well, what, Dave? Around 11 o'clock yesterday morning, this started to blow up here at uh, City News. And if they were calling City News, they are probably calling all the news outlets in town. Vaccines by postal code. Um, has this worked out for anybody? 
I'd like to, to, to get some insight on this. Anyone have a tale to tell? And did anyone get a vaccine because of your postal code? I get, a couple of days ago, the government released this list. Okay, if you live in this municipality and you're 50 plus and this is your postal code, first, first three digits of the postal code, you can get a shot. Okay, it's your turn. You've hit the postal code lottery. And I guess people were calling, trying to make appointments, and uh, it's no dice. There's confusion. Oh, sorry, that postal code is not eligible, even though it's supposed to be eligible. And people are calling us and they're blaming the media. And we got the list from the government. It's not our fault. <laughs> it's just from, but from the sounds of it, it was just another vaccine hot mess. If anyone has any information to share on that this morning, I'd, lo I'd love to take that call. Again, during the talk back hour, okay? Well, I would take a call on anything to do with vaccines. I read with interest Kelly Egan's column in the paper this week uh, about the local vaccine clinics with lots of staff with nothing to do, just kind of milling about because people, I, I don't know, aren't showing up for appointments. I mean, how frustrating is that? You know, here I am. I'd love nothing more to get, to get a shot of vaccine. And yet appointments are going unfilled throughout the day. What gives? What's been your experience? If you've been vaccinated recently, first, good for you. But, um, I mean, was it a busy place when you showed up there? Are you impacted at all by this decision to cancel? Here we go again, canceling elective surgeries, right? Now it's province-wide as of uh, Monday. Totally foreseeable. Because of the situation in the hospitals, in ICU, just, you know, not enough staff, not enough beds to get everything done to accommodate everyone. Here we go again. The backlog was already at about 150,000 cases across Ontario. And uh, I interviewed the CEO of the Ottawa Hospital. When was that, Dave? Like two weeks ago, maybe. Cameron Love? Just a few weeks ago, he was on the Rob Snow Show. I asked him, what's the backlog at the Ottawa Hospital? for elective procedures, and he said it's 15,000 cases. 15,000 cases, and they have to cancel them again. And um, they're the most popular procedures, right? Hip and knee replacements, cataracts, bypass surgery, MRIs, CTs, all going to be put on the shelf again for at least a month at some hospitals, and that's assuming that things are better in a month. There's no guarantee things are going to be any better in a month. It could, it could get worse. But if you've been affected uh, at all by that, g give me a call and tell me what you've been told, if you've been told anything. Sometimes people these things happen and the people aren't even told anything. And if you want to talk about the passing of, of Prince Philip this morning, that's fine too. 99 years old. What a life lived. My goodness. I don't have much to say about it. I, I, do, I, you know, I do think about the Queen, Her Majesty... I grieve for her and her loss, losing her, her partner, her consort after all the decades that they have spent together. Can you imagine, Matt? Married 73 years. 73 years. This couple, the only regal couple I have ever known and that my father has ever known. The queen is 94 now. A yeah, tremendous loss for her. And the Commonwealth has lost a dutiful public servant. But if you have anything to add on the passing of Prince Philip, by all means, Lowell Green coming up next on the Rob Snow Show on City News. To opening a business, in a, especially in a pandemic, in that kind of situation, is very challenging. First... Uh, people don't know me, people don't know my product, to build a new clientele, to build a trust for them, to, to show them that I care about it, I do love my food, uh, that was the biggest challenge. And of course, in all lockdown, um, we had to face it regards my employee, 
guest ladies what they work for me I didn't want to tell them sorry I'm close I'm not having a job for you no they have a families they have a fam kids to feed so this is very important because we are family orientated and uh, we decided to open we of course essential business so uh, been very tough very very tough as we didn't see people on the road market was completely quiet but we knew that we have to wait and we knew it that we're gonna be fine. In this town, we build an um, online shop, uh, Vedel Online, and uh, we did Uber, Uber Eats, which one is picking up and is very, um, very popular. We have a really good uh, feedback, so this is the um, uh, song for my heart. And uh, yeah, and we try to uh, expand. I thinking about opening another location, so uh, I want to make Vedel famous. I want to make the Vedel place to be for all the families with kids try the traditional food, what their grandparents cooked in the countries when they're from, or even Canadian people. I'm, they're more than welcome to come and try our famous pierogies. I try to be passionate about my food, uh, organic food, food made with love, with all homemade, uh, organic. So. Uh, you can find uh, food from all over the Europe, Polish, German, Ukrainian, Romanian, um, French, uh, Armenian, so all kind of different uh, types of food. Uh, homemade lunches, we focus on the homemade lunches, grandma style. Uh, I keep always saying, like in my Genya Babcha house, how she cooked, I wanted this love and this food over here because I believe that would bring all uh, all people around me and uh, yeah all the um, organic cold cuts uh, lovely selection of, uh, of uh, sausages uh, cheeses European cheeses uh, great selections of mustard uh, French uh, cookies all where you need from Europe you can find here at the Vedel Touch of Europe if you think good way that's it you have to I had the option to cry in the corner and say oh pandemic is coming no you need to stand up and fight for it and be have your eyes open think outside of the box and 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 do it firm fair fun the rob snow show returns on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 13 10 a.m good morning little green oh good morning rob i have a um a story about Prince Philip that I would like to share sure. with your listeners. Yeah. Uh, his death uh, has jogged my memory, a memory that goes back, in this case, uh, 63 years. It's the fall, uh, October of 1958, that terrible tragedy has struck the mining community of Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. 75 miners uh, are killed, 99 are rescued, very dramatic rescues. And, and I am there, um, I am covering the story for newspapers around the world, for United Press International. I am the only reporter for UPI, a major news, news wire service at the time. And my stories are appearing on the front pages of newspapers literally around the world, including in Britain. Uh, on October 31st, Prince Philip arrives in Spring Hill to um, allow himself to be interviewed and, of course, to offer condolences to the grieving widows, etc., etc. I, um, I ask for an interview, and I am granted, which very which surprises me greatly. I am, I am doing a very brief interview, and I introduce myself, and he said, I'll never forget, he said, uh, I, I can't remember the exact words, but it, he said, you're the man that wrote the story about the coffins. And I looked at him and I said, yes, I am. And he said, very moving, very moving. At which point uh, I thanked him and I did a little bit of an interview. The story about the coffins was very moving. I had forgotten that I, that I wrote this. It was a story that appeared, as I say, in newspapers around the world, including New York Times, uh, London newspapers, etc. Uh, a number of uh, family members were moving the furniture out of living rooms in Spring Hill to make room for the coffins they knew that would be arriving. Uh, you're you're uh, someone from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You, you may be aware that some of the older houses have especially wide doorways, particularly into the living room, which was designed that way to allow coffins because this is where the coffins through, this is where uh, the wakes were held. So a number, I, I wrote the story, I interviewed some of the people, the widows and, and family members, and they were moving furniture out of the living rooms to make way for, as I say, the coffins they knew that were coming in. It was a story that obviously had... Uh, some had, effect uh, on him. Had yeah, effect on yeah, him, yeah. and he remembered, and he remembered my name, which is why he allowed me an interview. So oh. um, I, I just remember him saying, very moving, very moving. And I forget what else. I think I was sort of stunned at the time. Probably, so, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. it was uh, it, it just, I had forgotten yeah. that story, to be honest with you. Yeah. And his death uh, this morning at about 4 o'clock, I was checking the news, and suddenly I suddenly remembered. I, I remember talking with him and him being essentially confident complimenting me. Uh, you, I, I agree with you, a, a great loss, the, the Queen's Rock, as she described him. On a, on a, um, a more current issue here, yes, yes, yeah. this, Rob, uh, it, it, I, to me there is a, a major growing mystery. Uh, you recall months ago the Prime Minister repeatedly standing in the House of Commons and boasting, essentially pounding his chest and boasting that on a per capita basis he had ordered more vaccines than any other nation on earth. You remember that. Yeah, for he, sure. He made, yes, they, absolutely. made the statement many times, repeatedly. Yes. yes. But here we are, we're almost four months to the in fact, next Wednesday will be exactly four months since the first vaccines were delivered to Canada. December 14th, as you recall, was uh, the first vaccines delivered to this country. Mm -hmm. And here we are four months later, and where are the vaccines? Uh, A lot of people don't understand. You know, we keep hearing, oh, the the big flood of vaccines and so forth. But, in fact, they're not coming in. To this point, I just checked this morning, so far only 6.56 million doses of vaccines have been administered. Now, Trudeau says that he has delivered 10 million uh, and and that those will be administered in the next day or two. That may very well be. But, you know, and and I've said this before, for everyone in this country uh, to be properly vaccinated, vaccinated twice, in other words, which is what we're supposed to, we need somewhere between 60 and 70 million doses. There are 37 million people. So if 30 million people are going to be vaccinated, we need 60 million doses. So at this four months later, we're looking at a situation with only 10 million delivered. And he's boasting, Trudeau is boasting that there's going to be another 2 million. I mean, whoop-de-doo. We're still, (laughs) I mean, where, where are these vaccines? Not only that, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you're aware that today or tomorrow, we're going to get about 330,000 uh, AZ vaccines from COVAX. This is the, the agency that is supposed, to, is supposed to supply vaccines to third world nations, and Canada is the only G7 nation taking from them. So we're going to get about 350,000 doses. But even so, we are still looking at less than yeah. 15, per, at this point, four months into it, less than 15% of what we require to get everybody vaccinated properly. So where all of these I mean, for example, I, you know, I look up the numbers every morning and yep. there, there are various sources that you can use. I've been using two throughout this whole thing. Yep, um, Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg, Vaccine Tracker, and Our World and Data. Just for yep. consistency's sake, I use those, I use those two. And this morning, um, it, it, it says that the United States will achieve herd immunity in three months, in three months, right? Um, So sometime in July, and that uh, Canada won't achieve herd immunity until either December or January. Well, let me give you some more dope that I'm sure you're aware. (laughs) The UK will achieve herd immunity this coming Monday. Yeah, that's what uh, the Royal College London said uh, this week. uh, Some of the very, very disturbing figures are that within a day or two, perhaps even today, the new infection rate in Canada will surpass the new infection rate of the United States. The, The American and the UK infection rates are falling dramatically as the vaccines are pumped into arms. Here in Canada, the new infection rate continues to increase. Listen to this. On January 1st of this year, 
Canada's rate of new infection was 168 per million population. 168, okay? In the United States at that time, the rate was 595 cases per million, and in the UK it was a very serious 677, uh, you know, per million in the UK. Guess what it is today? In the UK, it has dropped from 677 the per, per million population to 40. Wow. From 677 to 40. Meantime, our new infection rate has increased to 182. So it's gone up a bit. Right. In the United States, the rate has declined from 595 to 195 per million. Just slightly worse than Canada. But says world data, within a few days, the Canadian rate of new infections per million will rise well above the American rate. Furthermore, while the infection rates in both the U.K. and the U.S. are falling drastically, Canada's rate continues to increase. And the reason, of course, is we are, we are not getting vaccines into people's arms. Uh, we need 60 to 70 million doses. To this point, we've only received 10 million four months in. Mystery. Where the hell are the vaccines? Yeah, and I look, I, you know, I've been looking this up for weeks, and... And in the last, I don't know, two, two, three weeks, it seemed to take forever to, 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 to move an inch over six million, do, uh, six million doses. Well, that's because uh, it's dribbling in. And one of the things that I find very disturbing is that it seems to me that the media, whether intentionally or not, I don't know. And, and a number of health experts as well seem to be trying to make excuses. Um, you know, they keep talking about this big vaccine rollout. Right. We're supposed to be in the middle of a vaccine rollout. Two million vaccines in a month is a rollout? Please. I mean, let's, it, it's, this is the reason. Well, you know, six yeah. or seven million in four months. I mean, the Americans, the Americans are doing three million, sometimes four million a day. Germany, three, three Germany, I, you know, I heard, I heard yesterday um, NBC News said Germany did 700,000 in one day. 700,000 in one day. Well, that's about what the UK right. has been doing. But so you're right. So the UK is going to have herd immunity come this coming Monday, which means essentially the entire nation will be opened up. Israel, as you know, has already opened up. One of the things, too, that's very interesting is that, that these infection rates are falling drastically in the UK, the United States, Israel, and even countries like Turkey and Chile and so forth, which are, are, are pumping far more vaccines per capita than is Canada. I mean, anybody that doesn't think the vaccine works, I mean, just examine what's happening. Mm -hmm. Those nations that are, are vaccinated at a rapid rate, find their infection rate is dropping drastically. I mean, in the UK, from 695, 695 infections per million down to 40 since January. That's because more than 50% of the population's been vaccinated. So why people like Randy Hillier and his gang of, of idiots would continue to claim, oh, the vaccination doesn't work? Look around you. What if, if we really, 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 really want to end the lockdowns, if we really want to end the in high infection rates and all of the isolation, yeah. for God's sake, get get, get rolling, of get moving, get into moving. Our arms. Exactly. Yeah. Well said. Well said. But, but I, I repeat and this I, and I, you know, you've got a very keen mind and you've got a lot of listeners <clears throat> with keen minds where are the vaccines these these hundred million vaccines that trudeau claimed to have ordered where the hell are they four months in where are they okay thank you lowell green enjoy your weekend and we'll talk to you next week look forward to it bye-bye that's the legendary lowell green from bork news watch pierre bork right after the news
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 9th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 15 degrees in Smith Falls, 17. And here's what's making news this hour. Flags at city buildings will fly at half-mast in Ottawa until the funeral is held for Prince Philip. The Queen's husband died at the age of 99, Buckingham Palace issuing a statement earlier this morning. Funeral not going to be a public one because of COVID numbers and cases, but it will be held at a later date. Philip developed a reputation for being impatient and demanding, sometimes blunt, to the point of rudeness. But many believed he meant that meant he provided needed, unvarnished advice to the Queen. Premier Doug Ford is set to receive an AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine today at a drugstore in his riding of Etobicoke. He'll become the latest politician in our country and, in fact, around the world to be publicly vaccinated. The economy added 303,000 jobs in March, bringing the jobless rate federally down to 7.5 percent. It is the pandemic era low. Gatineau also dropped 0.3, down to 7.3% unemployed. Ottawa, though, climbed to 6.3 uh, from 6.1. As the scramble continues to get people out of harm's way in St. Vincent, a volcano has erupted. An explosive eruption is the way it's being described this morning on that Caribbean island. City News Time, 9.32. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. My regular Friday fling is back with me. Pierre Bork, how are you, you news hound? Uh, good morning, Rob. Uh, you know, we think we have problems and we certainly have our fair share of them, but imagine being a citizen of St. Vincent and the volcano explodes and yeah. they've got to evacuate the yeah. whole country. Yeah, unbelievable. Now, uh, yeah. People may not know, but when you look at the Caribbean islands, uh, St. Vincent is, is part of an island called, or a country called St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Grenadines are a bunch of other islands that are uh, nearby, and so they form the country. Uh, so St. Vincent is the largest of, of those uh, those islands. It's just south of Barbados. Okay. Are you trying out to be a Jeopardy host right now? Or, uh... Uh, having, <laughs> you know, you know, being uh, told to stay at home, you have to live vicariously. And uh, so you have to conjure up imagery that uh, gets you through the day. So that one uh, caught my fancy when I heard that news. Yeah. So the early morning breaking news, uh, Prince Philip passing away at the age of... Uh, 99. Any thoughts on that uh, this morning, Pierre? Well, uh, a life long lived for a man oh, yeah. born in Greece who was a sailor. Um, certainly uh, had a tremendous life. Boy, can you imagine the memories he must have had? And uh, well, the, the life experiences. Lived. Yeah, the experiences. Incredible. Yeah. Places he's been, the people he's met yeah. over decades, literally uh, a witness to history, a living witness to history. Yeah, like they. The one of the news networks this morning is saying he did twenty two thousand personal appearances. Yeah, like different yeah. events. Twenty two thousand of them. Yeah, I could tell. I could imagine after a while that would be a job. Uh, and as exciting as many of them, I'm sure were there are probably many others that he was committed to and booked yeah. uh, into his schedule on days when he uh, perhaps would have wished. Like, how many times can home. you listen to God Save the Queen? Right. If, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, but extraordinary, extraordinary, and married seventy three years to her. Right. Yeah. Just. Um, yeah, a job for life, isn't it? You know, I you know when when these things happen, um, you know, you, you, you know these these people that you, you you don't know, but they're kind of part of your life because they've kind of always been there, right? I mean, the Queen, for at least my, you know my generation and my father's generation, my father's in his mid seventies. Um, there's only been one monarch, right? There's only been one Queen. You know, she's 94. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, and he's been by her, he was by her side that whole time. You know, he's the, 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 there's only been one consort, 
my entire life, my father's entire life, his generation, right? So, I mean, it, the, the boomer generation, um, it's just, so it's strange when these things pass. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, I swore an oath to the Queen when I became an Ottawa City Councillor, as as did Jim Watson, Mike McSweeney, and, the, and Tim oh, Turney, yeah. the rest of them. Yeah. Everybody swears an oath to the Queen, and uh, so you have that in your mind when you when you um, accept the post. And uh, so it's, certainly the Queen and uh, Prince Philip, me, are two peas in the same pod. And uh, you know, condolences to that family and and those who support. Uh, I'm sure there are many. I know there are many. Um, it's it's a sadness for them. I also think, and someone was asking me this this morning, I guess that means that Prince Harry and Meghan will be back in the UK soon mm-hmm. enough, and that'll make headlines on... Yeah, and that'll uh, be its own... A different tangent. Yeah, and that'll be its own circus, right? So, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the top story this morning uh, for you at Bork.com, Canada COVID nears USA rate, which is, you know, quite troubling. Yeah, and, you know, Lowell, uh, Lowell presented that quite vividly just before your newscast. Um, and that essentially is a story that reflects that uh, circumstance. And uh, I, I think the, the point is that at some, at some point in, in the recent past, the promise of vaccines was not met with the performance of vaccines. And, and we're playing catch up. And when you look as I like to point to here to your listeners, Rob, on our site at Bork.com, we have the graph, the daily graph of new COVID cases. Yesterday was almost 8,000 new cases in one day, 7,984. Those are not my numbers. Those are official numbers. Uh, and, but if you look at the curve, we flattened nothing. We have flattened absolutely nothing since, I think, about June last year. And we are going back up, and we're very, very close now to the actual highest point we've ever had. Yeah, yeah. Which was just after Christmas. Yeah, and not much evidence that it's slowing. Not much evidence that it's slowing. No, it's fast rising, Rob. It's rising faster in the last couple of weeks than it did just prior to hitting the the high, uh, the all time high just before, just after Christmas. And so this is this is moving fast. It's moving in the wrong direction. And we are woefully unprepared. People are going to die here. They are dying. That's the sadness there. You've got the circus that happened in Kempville with a bunch of unmasked people uh, challenging the needs here. But, I mean, if you look around, at some point you're going to start to realize the people you actually know. Right now these are numbers. These are stories in the press. They're evocative. They're concerning. They're frightening. But at some point, and and for a lot of your listeners, I'm sure that point is already reached, they know somebody that's been impacted by this, somebody that's been in the hospital or worse has died. And it's um, younger people getting sicker now. Uh, we had a doctor on yesterday, uh, head of critical care, uh, a Dr. Warner at a Toronto hospital. Average, uh, what was the average age that he say, David? I think it was 38 or might have been 46. Of somebody 46, in, I believe. 46. Mid-40s. Yeah. That's right. Of somebody in his um, ICU, 46 years old now. Yeah, and not you know, ninety, that, not ninety anymore, right? Forty-six. Yeah, and you know, I think they they said, I know that gentleman you're referring to. Uh, they, the experts are saying that most of the new infections are people between eighteen and forty-two, and those are people that are ending up in the hospital, eighteen to forty-two. So you've got a, uh, an older population that is, has been inoculated. It's proving that that's working in a de- to a, a large degree. You're seeing it in the United States. You pointed it out earlier in other countries, Germany, the UK, other, you know, Israel. Uh, the vaccines work. They attenuate growth of this disease. And right now, that graph is absolutely frightening. Yeah. And if you're so- a politician, if you're, polit- if you're a politician right now, this weekend, this weekend, celebrating and resting on your laurels, and you're having your big liberal powwow. Yeah. And you're thinking, boy, we've done a great job. I, I think you, you've you got your eyes uh, Elmer glued together. You know, the eyelids are I, Elmer glued together, and you just can't see the forest for the trees here. Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, I don't know. There are days when I, I read the political news, and I think uh, he, he's not going to have an election. He says he doesn't want an election. I know O'Toole doesn't want an election because he knows he can't win. I think the New Democrats are like, yeah, whatever, we're not going to win anyway, but if they want to have an election, let's have an election. Um, But now, and then there are days like today, 
uh, the liberal convention, every second event at this liberal convention is about how to be election ready. Like a tutorial on election readiness and election fundraising and how to eke out a close race and how to vet candidates and how to win a nomination race. And, all, you know, like all of these all of these things for the for the liberal convention. There's a great uh, editorial about this in the Globe and Mail today. Um, it was pointed out this weekend, the New Democrats are going to they have the, some election ads ready to go. And apparently they're going to air on Hockey Night in Canada tomorrow. Uh, so, I mean, are we really going to do this, given the current state of the virus in the country? We think, are we really going to have an election? Like in a month or two, are we going to have an election? I think it lends credibility to those who think that uh, you don't need to socially distance, you don't need to wear a mask, you don't need a vaccine. If they pull the right. plug and call an election... <laughs> All of their arguments to the effect that you need to stay at uh, home and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might as well throw them out. Yeah. They don't believe what they preach. Right. And really, politicians in many cases uh, will preach something they don't believe anyways. In the case of, if I may point out, yeah. uh, the type of conference that's underway right now, the Liberal uh, Convention, these are um, accumulations of members, right? And and these are the members who will be going out to uh, to fight the election. And so all of that election readiness is just part and parcel of having that type of a conference. And sure, the big headlines might be Ken Dryden talking with uh, with uh, Chrystia Freeland, but there's a lot of rank and file activity going on. And, and that is the fundraising. That is how to organize. That is how to knock on doors, whatever you're going to be doing in a, in a virtual way as well. So that, that forms part of it. It's the mundane part of, of those weekends. Um, uh, you know, accumulations of members that, that happen uh, frequently. But it, then you get these people, they're stoked about it. They're stoked, oh, wow, we're ready to go. Let's go, let's go. Then you forget the reality of what's outside the convention hall, whether that convention yeah. hall is virtual or not. Yeah. Yeah, and you become David Peterson, maybe, right? Um, you, 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 well, you, you know, you do a um, like a spark, uh, snap election and it kind of blows up. It could It could blow up in your face, maybe. I don't know, you know. Um, anything, anything can happen. Anything could happen. Yeah, sure. Anything could happen. But I was wondering this morning, in anticipation of your appearance, I was because you you're kind of familiar with how he thought politically uh, and how calculating he was with Jean Chrétien. And I was thinking this morning, I really think Jean Chrétien would have had the election. It would have been over and done with, and he would have had his majority already if he was prime minister, even in this environment. He, I think he would have called it already and be done. Quite with it. possibly, and that might have been in the fall, though. That might have been in the fall. Uh, with the yeah, foresight. last fall, last fall. Yeah, yeah. With the for with the foresight of our hindsight, <laughs> last fall would have been the window to do it. And some of the provincial governments did just yes, that. Yes, they did. The, yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah. to great effect for those governments. But now this this whole uh, this whole pandemic is long in the tooth. And what we're hearing increasingly about is not the hope that's provided by government action, but it's the inaction and the problems that that entails. Okay. So do you think Doug Ford waited too long to do this stay-at-home order? Or do you think the stay-at-home order goes even far enough? Do you think he should have taken more drastic action? Just with kind of where are you on, on those things right now, Pierre? Well, you know, we talked last week that whatever they've done in the last six months clearly hasn't worked. Yeah. It just hasn't worked. Right. And so why do the same thing? You've got to change things up. And you're hearing the health experts telling you consistently what to do. You're finding reasons why not to do that. And the numbers are going against you. And really, they're going in the direction that the health experts are telling you they're going to go. So you're left with a mess. And at the end of the day, you look back and say, well, okay, these last six, seven months here, the numbers alone just prove that we did the wrong thing. We've done the wrong thing. So now you got to think about what you do. And here we are. We've got to stay at home. Look, I drove through downtown Canada, such as it is yesterday. I had to do a couple of quick things. And the parking lots were full at yes. the malls. I don't know right. what they're doing. The yeah. restaurants, I don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But they were full. Really? And okay. there, was a lot, there was no shortage of traffic. So, you know, what about stay at home? Yeah, I, you know, I, I noticed that yesterday um, when the show was done and I hopped on the Queen's Way. I noticed no difference in the traffic yesterday being Thursday compared to, say, Monday. I really didn't notice very much. But anyway, 
Uh, yeah, I notice you're selling uh, you're selling your art via NFT, right? Non fungible token. Fantastic. How's that going? Uh, are you are you getting any bidders there or what? Uh, it's a it's a very exciting nibbles? space for any yes. For, it's a very exciting space for anybody in the uh, artistic world, whether that's uh, you know songwriting or writing proper uh, musicians, any of that. Yeah. I recommend you take a look at it. It's as exciting an environment as the crypto space was in the in the earlier days of uh, bitcoin and the others back in 2013 14 or go back even further to the mid 90s and the dawn of the internet it's the same excitement the same activity the same prospects of really changing uh status quo in many areas of society and i'm seeing that in nfts right now very cool we'll talk soon yes sir always great to hear from you my good friend pierre Bork. thank you Thank you. Right. Bye-bye. Uh, from Bork Newswatch, Bork.com, Bill Robson from the C.D. Howe Institute on advice for Christopher Freeland ahead of the budget. Don't be a big spender and raise the GST when we come back. Rob Snow Show on City News. I wanted to give gifts to my volunteers, so I started making, I knew this is a skill I had, so I made a chocolate that had, that had culture, a cultural based uh, with a teaching, because culture here is not just the little part, it's uh, the large part, it's the fundamental part of our, um, our organization. So then we started doing, you know, just little programs and we sell a few at a fair, and then we started getting contracts. People were starting to enjoy the the the, the, the chocolates, and started g- getting more and more contracts all across Canada. And then we decided to become a social enterprise, and we were able to create two jobs. And Val is one of our um, uh, uh, chocolatiers, very talented. Uh, we were able to help her with uh, employment. We started just with a little bit in the kitchen, doing a little bit of chocolate together, and next thing, it's just kind of taken off. And it's, it's great, because I love doing, to be creative, and we get to create a lot, and make up stuff, and it's just a, I just love it. It's just great that we get to make money back for Wabano, and it's helping me out, and we're helping just everybody out, Wabano and everything. <laughs> we met, uh, a, a very uh, socially conscious uh, business owner uh, being around town and we decided to, to uh, partner because beans and chocolate, uh, I mean coffee and chocolate uh, are sort of created the same way uh, and there's, uh, you know, and they're very, you know, uh, one, uh, one uh, origin uh, bean, you know, so uh, it was a good pairing together. And, uh, and it's, it's been a fantastic partnership for both of us. I was fortunate enough to get introduced to Purat, the head of Wabano Fine Chocolates, uh, through a local uh, networking group. And I was completely intrigued by the social enterprise that she was running. And, and then I looked at what we were doing, trying to support local business and supporting um, local communities, and it, just, it was a perfect match, and it's been fantastic ever since. We make every batch by hand. We temper it by hand to get to the consistency it needs to be to make a good chocolate. And one of the best, also wonderful things we did, we've re- connected with Ed, with being around town, and our coffee bars have been an amazing hit. So we're really excited about the connection with our, with our coffee. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Bill Robson is back, CEO of C.D. Howe Institute, which is out with a new report, recommendations for the upcoming federal budget. Good morning, Mr. Robson. Good morning. Nice to be back. Yeah. Well, let's get to the recommendation that uh, is certainly going to grab some attention, and that is... Um, proposing a uh, two-point hike in the GST back to where it used to be uh, at 7%. Why? Why? Well, it's, uh, 
there are times when you offer advice uh, fairly confident that it won't be taken and uh, as a recommendation for a GST increase in a couple of years uh, probably falls into that category. It's politically very difficult to do. Uh, the reason we included it in the shadow budget is because um, even if some of the trial balloons for big expensive programs uh, that have gone up turn out you know not to not not to have any follow up, uh, there's no question that the federal government is in the mood to spend big. Uh, and we've just uh, finished out a year where there was a deficit in the, you know, close to $400 billion. And so one of the reasons of putting the, the GST uh, in there is to just underline how, uh, in, how, how uh, much it's going to cost us if we, if we continue uh, with a lot of these programs, because ultimately you do need to cover them with taxes. You can't keep borrowing at the rate that we've been borrowing. So we just made the point, you know, a, a point on the GST is worth $10 billion a year, two points on the GST, $20 billion a year. If you're talking about new programs that are going to cost, you know, 20, 40, 50, 100 billion a year, that's what Canadians really need to be thinking about by way of what it's going to cost. Right. But you don't think, well, this paper does not recommend that the government go all in on new big government social programs. In fact, it recommends uh, no. abandoning them, right? Yeah. Abandoning those um Discussions. No, we don't. We're yeah. we're skeptical about that, and I I think I'd go back to something of the the same point, which is to say, when you're uh, borrowing as they have recently been doing, fifty cents of every program dollar uh, that they're spending, and and uh, you saw the the reference uh, to the the stimulus that might be spent seventy to a hundred billion over the next few years, which they penciled in without even putting any interest payments to cover the extra borrowing. It was just kind of, you know, as though this money was just uh, you know freely available for them to spend without even thinking about how they were gonna raise it. Um the that's no foundation for ongoing programs. It's one thing to be thinking uh, in terms of temporary help for the economy and the economy does need some help. Um but it's another thing entirely to be talking about programs that are gonna be uh, uh, you know, indefinitely into the future and are going to involve partnerships with the provinces because, uh, you know, the provinces have been in that situation before where the federal government was flush with cash for a while, uh, put these shared cost programs in place, and then when times got tough, the money dried up. So once again, you've got to be uh, only willing to put in place the stuff that people are actually willing to pay for when it comes time to be spending hundreds of dollars again. What do you think about the 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 lack so far of fiscal anchors. What, 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 what do you think? The absence of fiscal anchors right now. And, and well, it, should it there not a, be some? A, yeah, uh, I, I think you really do need to get to that. I mean, the, pan, the response to the pandemic uh, had a lot to be said in its favor. I mean, it was very quick. Yeah. Uh, and Canada, like other countries, uh, put a lot of effort into getting a lot of money out quickly, and that certainly cushioned the uh, impact of the pandemic. But if you go back to 2008-09, uh, after the response to that crisis, the federal government did balance its budget again. And we got the debt ratio down, and that meant that when the next crisis came along, uh, we were in a good position to deal with it. And you'd really like to see, I think, the current federal government be thinking ahead likewise, because these things do seem to happen from time to time. Um, and at the moment, the plan more seems to be to say, well, uh, you know, we're okay to proceed with this elevated debt level. Uh, and in fact, our projections have it t turning up again, uh, which is a, a concerning thing. Um, as though future Canadians wouldn't have issues of their own to deal with, and it was quite okay to just kind of kick this bill all down the road. Yeah. Plus, I mean, just because of the demographics of the country, aren't there just systemic bills that are going to come due, whether that's pension obligations, um, old age security? Oh. This paper recommends uh, not increasing old age security payments, by the way. Um you know, uh, guaranteed yeah, income healthcare. supplements, health care, long-term care costs, these sorts of things, right? Yeah, yeah health, I mean, health care is very much on people's minds now for you know, clear reasons. Um, and uh, a lot of that pressure is at the provincial level. Yeah. Um, and when you look at federal and provincial governments together, yes, there's a it's, – it's, it's already kind of rough on, on future Canadians. They um, – 
uh, uh, already we're kind of on the wrong end of many of the things you're talking about, paying for those pension costs for their 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 elders and um, uh, covering some of the health care costs that we already knew were going to be higher and, and now with what we need to do in long-term care, quite a bit higher. Um, so what what's concerning is that um, you know that we we now have a generation that's graduating into this weak job market. They've had their schooling interrupted. Um, it doesn't really seem fair to also be saying to them, and by the way, you're going to pay this bill. I think it's appropriate for those of us who benefited. Uh, from the supports during the pandemic uh, to pay some of that back because again what what I what I said earlier these things do seem to happen from time to time and it's just prudent and I think fairer to future Canadians if you uh, pay off some of of the debt that you uh, ran up in responding to one crisis before the next one hits yeah the authors of this report would not be very welcome at this week's uh, NDP uh, convention, I don't think. Federal corporate income taxes should be lowered from 15% to 13%. Okay, I wonder if that recommendation, Mr. Robson, is now dated, given what's happening in the United States. And uh, Joe Biden wants to increase corporate taxes. And Jenny Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, former Fed chair, is calling for a global corporate tax rate. Um, what do you think? Well, even if though, yeah, even if those things happen, though, Canada is still going to be at a bit of a tax disadvantage. And the reason for our, us putting that there is that um, there's a very strong bet being made, and it goes to our earlier discussion about how much borrowing they're planning to do. The federal government is really betting very strongly on two things: they're betting on interest rates staying low, and they're betting on economic growth being strong. And the key is that the if the growth of the economy is faster than uh, the rate at which interest is making your debt compound, then you can keep borrowing and you might be okay. Um, well, if you if, if that's your plan, um, it's not a good idea just to count on good luck to get you there. Uh, and we've already talked a little bit about the need to get borrowing down, which protects you on the interest rate side. But on the economic growth side, we really would like to see something in this budget that doesn't just involve spending money. Because when you look across the Canadian economy lately, and I'm talking about before the pandemic as well, housing is strong, that's for sure. Uh, and the consumer has not been bad lately, but business investment has been very weak. And in the long run, you really need that new machinery equipment. You need the new investment in uh, technology. Uh, intellectual property products is a big category nowadays where Canada is not doing well. And we really would like to see a higher uh, effort by businesses. And the concern right now is that a lot of businesses are looking at Canada and saying, nah, not really the most enticing environment. So it would be very good if this budget could have a couple of things that were kind of high profile. If not a corporate income tax cut, I do like the idea of a temporary investment tax credit. Just something that's out there that says Canada is a good place to invest. And then that bet that you're placing on economic growth being stronger uh, has a greater likelihood of coming true. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Robson. Great pleasure, as always. Thank you. Thank you, William Robson, Bill Robson, CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. It is the Friday Free For All Talk Back Hour. Your last chance to have at us for the week. You pick the topics. We don't pick the topics. And the phone lines are yours. Open now at 750-1310 here on City News.
1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 9th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 15 degrees in Smith Falls, 17. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and in the Valley. We are just getting the new numbers of COVID cases in Ontario today. 4,227. That is the new case total province-wide. 246 of those cases are in Ottawa. There are 64 new cases in eastern Ontario, 22 in the leeds grenville Lanark District Health Unit, and 12 new cases in Renfrew. Now, since the provincial government opened up vaccines to those 60 and older, there are just over 108,000 more doses doled out just yesterday. It means the total in the province is now over 2.8 million doses of vaccine given out so far. Now, the Premier is about to get his vaccine. He is scheduled to receive the AstraZeneca dose at a pharmacy in Etobicoke coming up in just mere minutes from now. He'll become the latest politician in our country and around the world, in fact, to publicly be vaccinated against COVID-19. City News Time, 10.02. Prince Philip, the Queen's husband, has died at the age of 99. Buckingham Palace says the Duke of Edinburgh died peacefully at home this morning. The Queen and Prince Philip lavished much attention on Canada over the years, each visiting more than 20 times. It was his final visit to our country in 2013 that Philip awarded new regimental colours to the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment. In a world where there is so much senseless violence, the regiment has an enviable reputation for peacekeeping. And I appreciate that it takes you away from your families and friends, but I know that they also have every reason to feel proud of your achievements. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau issued a statement calling Philip, quote, a man of great purpose and conviction who was motivated by a sense of duty to others. Flags at all city buildings in Ottawa will be flying at half-mast until Prince Philip's funeral is held. No date has been determined just yet. City News Time, 10.03. The unemployment rate dropped in March with 303,000 jobs created across the country. In Ottawa, though, the rate went up slightly to 6.3%. In Gatineau, it went down a bit, but still at 7.3%. With more on the national picture, here's our senior business editor, Mike Apple. The month of March saw a remarkable recovery for the labor market with 303,000 jobs regained, employment numbers increasing, including gains in sectors that were hardest hit by public health restrictions. As the economy in the early stages of March saw a bit of a reopening, the big issue is the here and now with economies back into lockdown on various provincial levels. The uh, numbers still leave the labor market about 300,000 jobs below pre-pandemic levels. The unemployment rate came down to 7.5% from 8.2%, which was also much below forecast. Stats Canada did issue a note of caution, saying that the employment figures may renew a downward trajectory because of renewed lockdowns this month. At the Business Centre, I'm Mike Apple. City News Time 1004. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Clouds will increase through the day, but another very warm day for us. A high 22 degrees. Tonight, mainly cloudy and 10, and tomorrow up to 24. Sun and cloud. For Sunday, windy with rain showers. Not quite as warm, but still well above average. The high 18. For today, the high 22. Right now in Ottawa, 15 degrees. In Smith Falls, it's 17. And just in time for the weekend, National Capital Commission opening up roadways for active use this weekend, facilitating more safe outdoor space for people to get some exercise. In light of the provincial stay-at-home order and warm weather forecast, NCC expanding the Queen Elizabeth Driveway pilot project to include the Sir John A. Macdonald and Sir George Etienne Cartier Parkways this weekend. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. I'd love your reaction to that news that broke two minutes ago. You heard it right here during our 10 o'clock newscast. And yeah, you heard that right. The new number is out. 
Uh, David, so far, no fine print to that news uh, on the case count. No, well, you know, this is a data screw up and there are extra cases or anything like that. Nothing like that so far. Not as of yet, but I will point out, Christine Elliott has not issued her typical Twitter announcement about the number, so it's possible we'll find that out. These are sort of early leaks coming through the media, but um, not as of this moment, no. Ontario-wide... 4,227 is the number that we have right now. Now, again, there may be some fine print. Maybe they'll say something like, well, you know, there are 100 cases in there that you know from a day ago or from two days ago. Maybe, but so far, nothing like that. But that would be a new record, new one-day record. I mean, by about 1,000 cases or so, 3,227. 4,227. 4,227, ladies and gentlemen. What do you think of that number? My gosh, what a number. Terrible. The number that we have right now for the uh, Ottawa Health Unit, Ottawa Public Health Unit, 246, a new record. A dozen cases for Renfrew. 64 for the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, which is like parts east of Ottawa, well east of Ottawa, uh, United Counties, uh, Hawkesbury, Cornwall, uh, Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, 22. Uh, The previous one-day record for Ottawa was just, well, it was last weekend, wasn't it, David? It was like April, April 3rd. Yeah, so last Saturday. Last Saturday. And here we are Friday, 4,227 and 246 for Ottawa. So, um, if we get more information on on those numbers, you know, if there's a you know a proviso or some fine print there, we'll let you know. But right now, the top line number for case counts, ladies and gentlemen, on this the Friday free for all is four thousand two hundred twenty seven. So I mean, let's start right there. Seven five zero thirteen ten seven five zero thirteen ten six one three seven five zero thirteen ten. This is the Friday free for all. I don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics. You call me. I don't call you. And people have called me already. Uh, Ottawa South. Heather. Good morning, Heather. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi there. Okay, I'm calling about the vaccines by postal code. Vaccines by postal code. Did you try this thing or I, what? I called them on Wednesday. All right, okay. And I spent three and a half hours listening to elevator music. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, but I did get through. Yeah. And I did get an appointment for Sunday. Oh, good for you. I'm glad to hear Now, that. Yeah, um, okay. it's a different phone number that they have to phone, though, so people might just be calling the wrong number. Okay. Okay, the number I called was 613-691-5505. Okay. Now, with the postal codes, even though they, they, they only gave, like, the first three of the three or four different air postal code numbers. Right, yeah. Once, once you get through, then they say, okay, now what's the last three of your postal code? Oh, okay. And then and then they said, okay, now after that, we're doing it only age 65 and over. Oh, okay. And, and I happen to be over 65, so I, I happened to get my appointment. So you were lucky that way. Yeah. But I don't think that was well communicated. Because no, that, no, because right. even on the news, like when they show the, the the phone numbers and the places and the things and whatnot. Said 50 plus, right? They, they said 55 plus. But they were actually plus. concentrating okay. only on 65 and above. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Okay. So that yeah. might be what people are doing wrong. They're just well, calling the good. wrong, because they gave two different numbers. Yeah. And people might just be calling the wrong number. So where well, it's Sunday. Sunday, you're getting your appointment. Yeah, and where? I have to go go to, go across town to the Good Companion Center. Oh yeah. Okay. Down. Uh, well, that, down that, down that's kind of downtown area, area yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 I know where that is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's worth it. Oh, oh definitely. And, <laughs> and, and, and I don't care. Beggars can't be choosers at this point, Heather. Right? If you can get it, go and get it. Right? No, so. I don't care what they stick in me. I just want them to stick yeah, something in okay. my arm. Yeah. Okay. And did you? Were you able to book both appointments, first no. dose and second dose? No, for, for first dose only. Oh, okay. And currently, they'll be giving out the second dose dates once, once you get after there. We get our shot. Once you get there at the center. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So anyway, that's that's a little bit of what So that's kind of how it worked, though. Yeah. Three and a half hours to go through that. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. Okay. Yeah, yeah so uh, if, if people are phoning that, like, between 50 and So, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know your circumstance, Heather, whether you're retired or whatever, but... Um, I'm, I'm retired. But, I mean, what if you, you know, you're working eight hours a day, right? And, uh, you know... You'd like to take advantage of it. Who, who, who has the time to spend three and a half hours on the phone to try and book a... Well, luck, 
hopefully my, my, my phone before. has a speakerphone thing, so I just hit the button. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I could go do other things. I see. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. But, but like every two minutes, they came on and said, okay, your position in the queue is number 375. <laughs> Okay. Your position in the queue is number 372. Oh, my gosh. All the oh. way down. And it took almost four hours. It took three and a half hours to get through to them. But, but it was very quick. Kind of like uh, uh, take one through. down, pass it around, 350 bottles of beer on the yeah. wall. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, that, that's just a little okay. bit. Okay. Thank you, Heather. How, Thank how you for uh, outlining it for me. Okay. Good stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The things you learn. Patrick uh, in Kempfield. Good morning, Patrick. Uh, good morning, Rob. It's yeah. in Kempville. I have an anecdotal, anecdotal story uh, about uh, the restaurant in Kempville that stayed open yesterday, if you're interested. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so yes, This is where the so protest live, was. They had the protest. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I live a little bit outside of town, and uh, I live right beside a, an old communications tower. My okay. friends and I are known to loiter at the top of it sometimes, and yesterday when we were making our climb up there, a police officer came and told us to come on down, and as we were being detained, I'll call it, uh, he, uh, him and his, his, the other police officer were mentioning how busy they were last night. Oh, yeah. That's unusual for a Thursday night. In, uh, Thursday in night Kempville. in Kempville? Okay, all right. Exactly. And uh, then they mentioned, they started talking about the restaurant and how they needed more people there. And all of a sudden, they, they got all uh, different and said, uh, gave us a quick talking to and sped off out of their cars and lights on, got out of there. Um, and then uh, only last night, I... Took the time to look it up on the computer. We're losing you, Patrick. Talk right into the phone, buddy. We're losing you, Patrick. Hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the restaurant taking a stance against closing, it, it's a little disappointing. Being from this community, I know the restaurant well. My wife and I are known to go to it. And it's, I'm, I understand maybe why they had to do it. But at the same time, I think there was different options maybe they could have done. Right. But really what's upsetting to me and other people I know from town is uh, that uh, Randy Hillier really attached himself to this um, this cause and this protest? I I think uh, I don't like him. I don't want him in my community around sure. the people that sure. I love. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, I mean, just, we were, we're yeah, Patrick. I'm sure we're, you and me are the same. We were all pro business, right? We want it, we want restaurant owners to to do well and to survive and 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 come out the other side of this. But at the same time, um, we're not. We you know we're not crazy anti-maskers you know, going around the province saying it's a hoax, which is kind of the Hillier shtick, right? It's it's a hoax, and you're being lied to, and it's a conspiracy and all of this stuff. I mean, who, who's it's into sad. that, it's right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, That's and, you know, I, 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 what, was was there a big crowd there, Patrick? Did you hear? I or? heard it was massive. Somebody massive. was live streaming from there, I guess, oh, on yeah. Facebook or something, and okay. it was a party to be, the party to be. But. Really? Yeah, yeah. And here we are, you know, we've got this number today, 4,200 cases across uh, Ontario. 4,200 cases. You think Randy oh, Miller is yeah. one of them? I hope so, eh? Well, I, I, you know, I don't wish it on anybody. You know, That's I don't wish point. it on anybody. Yeah, no, I know. But uh, you know, yeah. it's hard not to think, like, how is this guy going from one place to the – what happens if he gets it? What, what kind of look is that going to be? He's not a young man, right? So, all right. Thank you, uh, Patrick, for the scoop from Kempville. There you go. Um, here we go. Uh, Gord Edwards in Edwards. In beautiful. Hey, hey, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I, I, I don't get too many callers from Edwards. Well, I've got a uh – a little funny thing. You do. I ran, okay. I ran it by your the guy before. Yeah, David. The yeah. number to call for your vaccine. My my son got an email. He's twenty five. He was the phone to get it. Well, he thought it was supposed to be for me. I'm sixty three and probably medium high risk area. So he thought I was getting. I phoned the number one eight 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 nine 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 six four eight eight. Mm-hmm. But I've moved the six and the four around, so I just put in four, six. <laughs> okay. So if everybody on your show wants a good laugh, and I ran this by your producer, okay. call one eight eight three eight nine 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 four six right eight eight, and you'll get a real good laugh. Okay. All right. Okay. Now um, about the butter. 
about I the butter. Baked, I eat baked potatoes. Holy cow. Hold on. Hold on. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Uh, Gord, Gord, Gord. I know you're down there in, in dairy country in Edwards, right? <laughs> but I, I, you got to give me a second here. We can't jump from, uh, you know, toll-free telephone numbers to butter. Okay? Give me a chance okay. to catch up. Are you talking about the butter being hard? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, because I've been, follow, I've been following your show. Sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So Buttergate. Yeah, Buttergate. Put, put, yeah, yeah. Put, it, put it on 400 degrees, baked potatoes, and it still doesn't melt. You put it on 400 degree baked potatoes and it still wouldn't melt. Yeah. No. So yeah, what do you think is that. going on? What do you think is going on? That palm oil is going to you drive us crazy. Palm oil, you're right? Maybe it's palm oil. Okay. So the jury's out on, on that. Now on another side, um, <laughs> you're following the, um, the the oil line five. Line and, five, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I yeah. remember all years ago it coming out that Ontario and Quebec produce the majority of the hydro for the northeastern states and the states around the Great Lakes. Well, Hydro Quebec is a major supplier to parts of the uh, New England states, yeah. primarily. Yeah. And uh, Quebec would be affected by this also. Why do we not just say, okay, no gas, no hydro? No, yeah, well, yeah, okay. You know, tit for tat. I suppose you could do that, yeah. It's, it's tit for tat. Tit for tat, yeah, yeah. You shut off the gasoline, we'll turn off your lights kind of thing. No, sure. <laughs> okay. Because gas, gas is our main heating source and yeah. stuff. Yep, yep. And, well, I, uh, they better sort that out. So let it, five it weeks from now, five, yeah, well, yeah, May. In the May. May. I thought yeah. it was May 15th, but I'd have to look it up because well, I haven't covered no, it in a while. Well, no, it's, that's um, here and there. But Agent 1310, if you would like a mission... <laughs> Okay. There's something you there's something you could look up. How much hydropower we How much hydropower do we sell to the United States? How much hydropower do we sell to Michigan? Well we yes. don't sell it to Michigan. Actually Ontario Hydro pretty much gives it away for free. Yeah. If not well, at a loss. That's the thing. All right, Gord. So, gotta go. I 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 gotta go. What happens when you call that phone number that he's talking about, David? He says if you call that phone number you get a laugh. Have you called it? I haven't called it yet. But I have it on good authority. It goes to one of those, uh, uh, well, let's say you, you get a companion for a fee. Oh, a companion. If okay. You call oh, I see. For... Okay. All right. The kind of stuff you read about in the WAN ads in the Ottawa Sun, you mean, something like that's, that. Right? That's that okay. sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. 1018, uh, Rob Snow Show. This is City News. We just took over this business about a few weeks prior to the pandemic. But we've been loving the community, the people, very friendly. Um, but it's been very difficult starting up a new business, just the time that we did. But I'm sure it's the same everywhere. We did take a broken business, which doesn't help us. But uh, we thought, we just, we believe in what we do. We're very passionate about food. And we just really wanted to share the Iraqi culture through our food. All our recipes are homemade. So this is very unique. Usually you hear restaurants, shops, it's all frozen food or prepared food. So nothing here is prepared. Everything is homemade. We get our meat and produce from a local farm. So supporting local is the way to go. We are supporting all the way. Um, and our meat are actually marinated the day of, so it's as fresh as can be. Quality ingredients and everything is made from scratch. I get a lot of people when they come in, they say it tastes like Middle Eastern, like back home. So for you to have been to Iraq and have the food there, you can really like compare and see the similarity. We do like to focus on healthy. So our recipes, not only the homemade, again, everything is from scratch, but we have like from combos and to, to like small sandwiches. Our, our, one of our favorites and a lot very popular is the chicken salad and the beef salad. So now you're getting all the protein and all these amazing ingredients that we all need. During this time, I find a lot of people are sitting at home and not enough movement. So to come here and get something healthy, healthy other than go elsewhere and just put, you know, what's not so good for our bodies makes a huge difference. So we have shawarma sandwiches, combos. I mean, if you're looking for a meal to 
feed your family, I would highly recommend a family platter. It comes literally with everything, with potatoes, um, with rice, with chicken, with beef, um, and we don't charge extra for mix. I know a lot of places do. Here we just add everything to your platter. And lots of healthy choices for sure. We're very passionate about food and for our small family business, it's, it's been good. Like I said, it's a little struggle, um, but we are not a chained restaurant. It's time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. So again, big uh, number today for case counts. I've never seen, you know, in a year of doing the this show, never seen anything like this in the pandemic uh, broadcasting <laughs> era. 4,227 is the case count for Ontario in the last 24 hours. 4,227. I think it's a record. Uh, kind of a working to confirm Ottawa 246 which is a new record uh and again 64 in the eastern Ontario health unit what is going on yeah in that area Leeds Grenville Lanark 22 uh Renfrew 12 Toronto 1218 in Toronto wow holy cow um, 105,000 vaccines given out yesterday, so solidly above 100,000. Uh, and again, the, you know, the premier, the premier's getting vaccinated today, by the way. Uh, I think he got a shot this morning in Etobicoke in uh, Ford Nation. Uh, premier has said uh, 150,000 a day is the goal. So anyway, that's some of the stuff going on. It's Friday free for all here on the Talkback Hour. This is the Rob Snow Show. Our phone lines are your phone lines, 750-1310, Anne in Ottawa. Good morning, Anne. Uh, hi, I'm sorry to call again two days in a row. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I was just looking at something, you know, I was just on the, on the computer and this Twitter comes up. We are now officially behind, I don't know if you mentioned this already, Morocco and Turkey in doses per hundred. Oh, yeah, we've always been behind those two countries. Oh, my yeah, yeah. God. I mean, the key to everything yeah. is Bahrain, vaccines. Chile, yes. <laughs> all kinds of countries. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and still you will hear liberals defending him and saying we're doing such a great job and everything mm -hmm. it's it's like some kind of magic trick that that isn't really <laughs> coming to fruition i i don't know but people that would still vote for this guy you need to have your heads red you really do because he's doing a lousy lousy job he has from the beginning vaccines are the key to everything and it, like it's frightening yes mm -hmm. and i mean we have to get people vaccinated but where are the damn vaccines and, and the other thing i wanted to tell you about i know you've you've interviewed dan mcteague before right yes Quite a I few have. Times. Sure. Yeah, yeah anyway yeah. i heard a mind-blowing interview with him on roy green last saturday and first of all he was being a little cautious about what he said and and then roy said no it's because he said i'm not sure if i should say this and i, I roy, roy said hey have at her he just lit in to the Trudeau government about it is just fabulous. And I was like, <laughs> yes, I want to hear the truth. This right. is a stupid thing to do to our economy. Right. And it's cruel in a cold country. But there were oh, so many... Oh, on the carbon tax. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. and you got to remember Dan McTeague is a liberal. <laughs> well, he was, a, he was a liberal MP for something like 12 years. In the Kretschian like government. In the Kretschian like, government. Yeah, yes, yeah. Different yeah. kind of liberal. Different yeah, kind of exactly. Liberal. Like, yeah. The, anyway, but yeah. if you get a chance and you want to listen to it, you, sure. you might... Yep. Yeah, well, I'm, I you know, I should call him again anyway and get him yeah, on the show. Yeah, yeah, so and tell him to be unplugged. <laughs> unplugged, yeah. Yeah, because he usually was. is. He usually is. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ann. Okay, okay bye. thank you. Yeah, 750 1310. Uh, 750 Chris, downtown. No, not Chris. Cameron. Sorry, Cameron. Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. Yeah. Hey, Rob, how's it going? Good, good. Are you at McDonald's again? Yes, I am. <laughs> And uh, what would you like in your coffee, sir? No, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Um, so, what's yeah, it, what? I, I mean, yesterday I was, uh, when I called you, I drove like all day. Yeah. My regular uh, 30 days a month, 10 hours a day of driving. Yeah. I don't get my summers off either, actually. Okay. Um, and um, it was like, I don't know, borderline 
Woodstock out there, uh, <laughs> sunshine, lollipops. Sure. Uh, the young. So and- it didn't look like a stay-at-home order was in effect, is what you're saying. Right? <laughs> no. Uh, Lots no. of traffic, right? Lots of traffic, right? Uh, well, yeah. a lot of traffic, a lot of foot traffic, a lot of people in the park on the benches sure. hanging out. Yeah. Uh, a lot of old people, I gotta say, with no masks on. Oh, okay. It was, you know, I just um, and. Yeah, I think this is, like I said, it's a mockery of everyone's time and lives. I think by making fake lockdowns, I think that also indirectly trivializes everyone that's gone bankrupt and everyone that died from this. It's 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 an insult. I think, uh, <laughs> I think they should just do their lockdown already, do the real thing, and Ooh. get it over with because people are... Be harsh. But, uh, Be severe is what you're saying, Cameron. None, yeah, no, none of these half measures. Already. Yeah, none of these half measures. Yeah, for a good take on that, thank you for your call, Cameron. Um, for a good take on that, um, my colleague Mark Sutcliffe, excellent column in the Ottawa Citizen today, and that's the whole theme of of his column in uh, in the is half measures that uh, Ford. What can you say? He he, tr- you know, he just tried to walk too fine a line. Uh, and and instead, this is kind of where we are. And he, Chris Ellie in the post said it, it's kind of even this stay at home order is kind of a paper tiger of a stay at home order because look around who's staying home. Are you, <laughs> right? So um, maybe maybe in light of these case counts, maybe may, might even have to go even further. Who knows? Uh, 680 News, our sister station in Toronto has crunched the numbers, and uh, this number for today, more than 4,000 cases, is indeed a record for Ontario at 4,227. And we have indeed hit halftime on the Talk Back Hour, right back on the other side of our newscast, with more of your phone calls on the Friday free-for-all, 750-1310 on the Rob Snow Show here on City News. news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. 
It's Friday, April 9th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 18 degrees. And here's what's making news at this hour. It's another record number for cases in the province, a record number of COVID cases in Ottawa. 4,227 new cases province-wide and in Ottawa, 246. The latest numbers from the province just released in the last half hour. Eastern Ontario has 64 new cases. There are 22 in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, 12 more in Renfrew County. Positive cases come from about 61,400 completed tests, and the hot zones just continue to have extremely high numbers. 1,218 in Toronto, 762 in Peel, 532 in York Region. Prince Philip has died. Buckingham Palace releasing a statement this morning saying the Queen's husband died peacefully, two months short of his 100th birthday. The Prime Minister and the Premier both expressing their condolences online on behalf of the people of this country and province to the royal family. In Ottawa City, flags will be lowered to half-mast until Prince Philip's funeral that does not have a date yet. 303,000 jobs created last month. It has lowered the national unemployment rate to 8.2%. In Ottawa, the rate actually went up slightly, 6.3% now, and it's 73 in Gatineau. City News Time, 1031. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Friday free for all. Pick a topic, preferably newsworthy. We'll do our best to roll with it. Almont. Chris. Good morning, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing, Rob? Hanging in there, buddy. Yeah. Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I did the uh, registration yesterday. It took about 15 minutes. Okay, okay. By phone. And yep. uh, I just happened to be, I guess, bilingual. So uh, I pressed the two on the uh, phone thing, and uh, I was uh, connected within uh, 15 minutes. Oh, I did really? my registration about 10. Okay, good for you. So when do you get in? When do you get in to get uh, a shot? I have my first on the 28th of uh, April. Oh, okay, okay. And they've already built in the second, and it's 28th of August. 28th of August. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so they've already built it in. Okay. It's, right. Well, uh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. It's now the law. Uh, the other thing is uh, we keep talking about numbers of vaccines, and I know it's very, very disturbing. I think what we need to do is focus on why. And it's someone's fascination with China. Mm. I read the uh, Kinsella article today in the uh, Sun. Yes. Yes. And he basically sums it up. And uh, I think we really need to study that and understand what is going on because uh, sure. yeah. that's going to cost a lot of lives. And uh, it's a failure, really. And uh, it's something that... Plus, you know, why, right? It's, it's so head-scratching. You know, what, 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 what's, what's, what's the decision-making rationale there? They're holding two of our people hostage. Uh, you know, they've used trade as a weapon against us. They they mock us, bully us at every turn. Why would this this country? Why would why would the leadership in this country agree to any kind of research deal with that country? And uh, so they you know they do this dance, this three month tango, and uh, the candidate vaccine it never it, it's not even allowed to leave the airport in Beijing. They block it. That was I mean, did they not? After you know, they signed a deal. Yeah. Did they not think that that was going to happen? I mean, it was totally foreseeable and predictable, <laughs> right? That was three days after yeah. they signed so, the deal. Yeah, yeah. The Chinese said, "No, it's not coming," and then they sat on it for the whole summer instead of buying vaccines till August. Well, I mean, yeah, and um, <laughs> iPolitics had a story this week where it kind of flushed out. You know, some of these deals with vaccine manufacturers really weren't finalized until November. Right. Yeah, so, because, yeah. you know, everybody else is buying the vaccines. Right. So, anyway. I mean, the Israelis were out there probably in May of last year. Buying so, there are lo- you know, there are lots of questions, and, and you're right. You know, we still trail, and thank you, Chris, for your call. I really appreciate your call. I mean, you, you, you can take a look any given day at where we stand in this country when it comes to the vaccine rollout and how we compare with other countries and some of our peer countries. I've been using um, our world in data and the Bloomberg vaccine tracker looking them up every single morning. It's kind of like part of my morning routine now. 
for example, this morning at ourworldindata.org. Okay, this is people from Oxford University do this thing. Okay. One metric they use there is vaccine doses per 100 people. And in Israel, the number as of this morning was 117.7. So it's greater than 100. In the United Arab Emirates, which is second in the world, 88.04. Third, Chile, 59.61. Then the UK, 55.08. Bahrain, 51.71. And then the United States at 51.27. In Canada, the same number is 18 and a half. Israel's almost at 118. We're at 18. I mean, it's getting better. I mean, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's so far removed from a, like, any kind of gold medal performance. It's kind of like, just kind of so typically Canadian, like, oh, personal best. Our world in data says the United States has done 171 million doses. India, 90 million. The UK, 37.4 million. Brazil, 24 million. Turkey, 17 million. Germany, 15 million. Indonesia, 13 million. France, 12. Italy, 11. Chile, 11. Israel, 10 million. Canada, uh, as of this morning, 6.99 million. So you round it off and call it 7 million. In 116 days, 17 million doses administered in 116 million in, in 116 days. At the Bloomberg vaccine tracker, the it says that the United States is still averaging 3 million doses every day. Every day. Here we've done 7 million in 116 days. What we've managed to do in 116 days, the United States is doing in a little more than two days. 171 million doses in the United States, 7 million in total here. 3 million a day in the United States, 191,000 here a day, 191,000 here. 191,000 compared to... Well, Germany, yesterday, I heard on the news yesterday, 700,000 in one day. The UK is averaging more than 300,000 a day. France is 335,000 a day. Italy's almost a quarter of a million a day. And now a lot of people are looking at this one. Um, how many people have had one dose and how many people have had two doses? In the United States... 33.7% of Americans, 33.7% of Americans have received at least one dose of vaccine and 19.9% .9 of Americans have been given two doses. One in five Americans fully immunized now. In Canada, only 16% of Canadians have received one dose and 3% of Canadians have received two doses. In other words, 97% of Canadians are not fully immunized yet. 116 days after the first doses went into the first arms. It's almost 20% of Americans have had two doses in Canada, 3%. Come on, come on. More Americans have received two doses and Canadians have received a first dose. And we're worried about Americans crossing the border and coming here? Like, give your head a shake. The Americans are the ones who should be worried about unvaccinated Canadians going down south. Okay. Uh, Peter. Peter in Ottawa. Good morning, Peter. Oh, that's me. Uh, yeah, yes, Rob. Is. Yes, Peter. Uh, that, that's unbelievable, some of the numbers, I'm telling you. Yep. But I'm, I'm calling, it all boils down to one thing, and I, I've been talking to people about this, uh, you know, for the past couple of days and that, and I say the same thing. Bad leadership. Leadership, why, sure, yeah. Why, why, why is it, you know, I don't hear anybody saying this, but how did the second variant get into Canada? I, I tell them that. I said, how do you, I said, what's the two worst hit cities in Canada? Vancouver and Toronto. 
Both international airports. The airplanes sure. are coming in there all the time. Well, they're and, supposed to be. And I don't know how long you've been listening to the show, Peter, but I mean, it was a few months ago. I would list all the daily arrivals landing at those airports. Yeah. yeah. And it was like dozens and dozens and dozens of aircraft, right? Yeah. Every hour of every day coming into the airport. My brother said that. I said, just go outside and look at the jet trails going over Ottawa right yeah, now. Yeah. I'm out there and there's three of them. Yeah. Where are they coming from? Sure. And why are they coming here? You look at Justin Trudeau and say, why are you allowing these people to come into Canada for? Yeah. Oh, they're being tested before they get on the plane. Are they? We don't know. You know, and then you see the numbers. I think the people like. You Plus, know, you know, I would, I, 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 you know, I would go through some some flights that eventually arrived in Canada uh, would would uh, have three stops along the way. Yeah. You know, like, a, uh, you know, a flight originates in Seoul, South Korea. Yeah. Uh, ma- you know, it might make two stops along the way. Before it comes here. Before, yeah. before it comes to Toronto or Vancouver or whatever the case might be. Yeah, because right? they want to yeah. fill the plane up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's how they make their money. But, yeah. uh, so, you know, it's, it's anyway. Yeah. It's, you know, and then you wonder why, like, somebody phones up and says, oh, I seen people out there yesterday or walking around, no masks on, everything else. I think the people of Ontario, I think the people of Canada, we did our part. We've done our part. We, we, you know, I mean, look at the last lockdown. They flew drones down the city of Ottawa downtown, and it was like a ghost town. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Sure, I do. Yeah. We, yep. Well, we we are doing our part. But if Justin Trudeau and the Liberals up there don't want to do their part, you know, it, it was Doug Ford that stepped up to the plate and told them, right, in Toronto, people are getting off the plane and walking into a taxi. What the heck's going on here? <laughs> Okay, Peter. Thank you, Peter. You know, it's time to start pointing the finger in the right direction. Sure thing. Sure thing. Thank you, Peter. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Chris, West End. Chris. How you doing there? Oh, Chris, it's sunshine and lollipops, buddy. I don't know about you, but I've had a long week, and I can't wait for it to be over, (laughs) to be honest with you. It's better from here, trust me. I'm here to offer some solutions here for us. All right. Situation, um, open okay. to solutions, yeah. Well, solutions would be first thing is. How about this? I, how about this? I moved to the Pontiac, build a bunker, and come out in sometime in late 2022. How about that, Chris? For us? Well, that would work, but I mean, uh, it's not going to help out the other 36 million Canadians. All right. My solutions would be you got to test, and it goes by the leadership, as our last caller had said, Peter. Yeah. But in the way I would go about it is you test every single Canadian from coast to coast to coast. That would give you your basis where your outbreaks are, at least a base. Sure. The other thing is vaccines. Every Canadian needs to be vaccinated Mm -hmm. or unless there's a reason they can't or they don't really want to. All it would take for Trudeau to do is one phone call to Biden. Hey, whatever extra vaccines you got in May when you're finished vaccinating the country, send them here. We'll buy them. End of story. Done. You run the country like a business. Yeah, it was a hundred billion. Look how many billion we pissed away since the start of this pandemic. It's nothing. And when we have our extra vaccines, we sell them off, and away you go. Problem solved. Problem solved. You should be running the. You should be running the country, Chris. I believe it, but yep. uh, we got our hard worker up there. That's all we can do at the moment. All right, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank buddy. you. Yeah, have buddy. a great day. Yeah, you too. Bye. Yeah. Albert uh, out in Canada. Albert. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, it's good to hear your voice, Albert. Good to know uh, you're still I'm with hanging us. Hanging in, buddy. Good. Listen, good. Um, my call is a, is going to be of a concern for now, for your female listeners. Okay, now I'm due for another CAT scan at the beginning of May because my um, supposed cancer has metastasized to my lungs. So, okay. I uh, two days ago, my girlfriend and I got on the computer at 7:30 in the morning for our COVID shots. She got she got one coming up, and then they gave her a second dose exactly four months to the day that she gets her first dose, which is early next week. Right. My dose is set for Saturday. Now I'm not sure if I'm going to show up. I'm I'm in a, a little bit of a dilemma here, but um, dilemma has uh, brought me to some research where what's happening and what sh- what is um, what it should happen is when you get a COVID shot, what it does is it, it, it triggers your lymph nodes and it gets the lymph nodes to go bigger. So right now, um, in my research yesterday, um, the uh, John Hopkins University, other major um, institutions are advising women not to get a mammogram within four to six weeks of a uh, shot because 
um, of the increase in lymph nodes and the false positives, uh, especially um, in the breast and under the armpit. Now, um, okay. because my um, CT is scheduled for the beginning of May, I talked to my doctor and my oncologist today, say, so what should I do here? I'm scheduled on Saturday, and if they trigger my lymph nodes like they are uh, for the mammograms, uh, it's going to make a lot of confusion when my CT uh, scans come back for the uh, radiologist to read. So they basically, the, they told me, uh, go ahead, uh, okay. get the scan, uh, get the, get uh, the shot, shot. More yeah. if I want, okay. well, and okay. wait six, six weeks to get the second shot. But the problem, Rob, is that they didn't tell me when I'm going to get my next shot. If my next shot is four months after my first shot, right. and the CDC recommends as of today still 21 days for Pfizer, 28 days for Moderna, then why, why take a chance and screw up my radiology report right. that's due in six weeks from now? But I'm basically calling to let people know that uh, especially the women that uh, this is new now. Well, I would, you know, I, uh, Albert, I appreciate what you're trying to do, Albert, but I would, I would suggest that if people have their own medical concerns, they should consult with their own doctor. I'll, I'll, well, ju- I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, Albert. I'm going to leave it at that. But I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that you're still, you're still with us, and still fighting. It's good to hear your voice this morning. 10:46. Have to go. Be right back on City News. Papa Jack was started uh, 14 years ago, really by accident, more than anything. Uh, A friend of mine had bought a grocery store, a popcorn machine was in there, he didn't want it, I ended up by buying it. My family thought I was nuts. When I first said, come and pick up this popcorn machine, uh, my son said, what the heck for? Uh, I won't use the exact words. But anyway, uh, we started and it just kept on growing and growing. Um, but at the time, I was the only one selling popcorn in Ottawa. But we persever- persevered as a family, and here we are. So it's, it's been very, very rewarding uh, for my family and myself. And to see our brand name, Papa Jack, and Papa Jack came out of, I wanted something that was going to be very bilingual. So Pepe, and then in Ontario, everybody called me Jack, even though my name is Jacques. In, Ke- in Quebec, it's fine, it's Jacques, but in Ontario, it was always Jack. So we married the two together, Papa, Jack. With the store that we have on Thurston Drive, um, it basically, the factory's in the back. If you come in to the store, you can see how the popcorn is being made during the week. So it adds an, an extra uh, layer of, you can see the sanitation, you can see how we do it. Um, It's not like making popcorn. Most people thought when I started this, I was making popcorn in my garage or in my basement. Uh, No, never did. Uh, It was started in this building, in the back of the building, and then we kept growing and growing until what we have now. My daughter and my son came up with a brilliant idea to do a fundraiser online. So basically all people have to do is to register here and we give them a special code number. And with that code number, they tell their friends, their their neighbors, everybody to buy online from us with that code number. And then at the end of each period, could be two weeks, could be a month, then we'll pay them a 20% of all the businesses that we got through that code number. One thing I'd like to say is thank you to all the Ottawa people who have supported us and support local businesses. It, um, sometimes people, you know, they, uh, they talk about buying um, locally. Um, now it becomes that much more um, important to buy locally to support your local businesses because not too many of them are going to survive this. We're fortunate that we're so far so good. Time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 
613-750-1310. So David's uh, following all the social media digestation about the record-breaking case count today at 4,227. Yeah, you heard that, 4,227. Uh, variants, right? Uh, really driving things, Dave? Okay. The variants are very much taking over, as we have been hearing for some time now. So th- today's numbers, more breaking down the uh, the summary of the data, 44% of the new cases, so that's 1,863 of the 4,200-odd uh, cases are variants of concern. So we've now logged uh, 11,700 total variant cases to date. Okay. But the thing with the sequencing of the variants of concern, that you have to understand how they find these variants, it's a process separate to the testing for COVID-19. They have to genome sequence. Oh, okay. The test And that results, takes time. And right? that yeah. takes time. So yeah. there's a big backlog. The last number I saw was about 27,000 tests that they're currently sequencing. Oh, okay. So this is... Delayed. All that to say it's likely that it's actually more than 44% of the new cases are now variants. It's likely quite a bit more than that, which we've been hearing from the epidemiologists for some time that the variants of concern are now the dominant strain in the province and in the country. Okay, so uh, that's a big story. Top story here right now uh, broke uh, well this hour, right? Um, gosh, such a big number, 4,000. Um, Renfrew, Regan. Good day, Rob. Yes, sir. I- I think uh, you're going to see four to 6,000 at the end of next week starting. And uh, I also think we need curfews. Curfew? As much okay. as I hate to say it. Right. Okay. Uh, I also think old Tom, if he's still kicking, should run for the premiership. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard from him for ages, so right. I don't know. Right. But I also think there's going to be an early summer election or spring election. But uh, that's... That's just kind of my take on everything. Well, there's a lot of speculation about an election. I think, you think he's going to. You think he's really going to do that to us? He's going to bring in the budget and he's going to say, "This is my bold vision for Canada." And look at the opposition; they can't even get their act together. You, you have to vote for me, and let's go now. And we'll, yeah, I think that's what he's going to do because yeah. then people will be off for the summer with golden visions. But right. okay. uh, anyway, you you have a good weekend. You too. Thank you for your call. Thank you for your call. Uh, Bob. Oh, hello. Uh, hello uh, yes. Hello, oh, Rob. Bob. Bob and Vanier, right here in Vanier. <laughs> how are you yes. doing, Rob? Oh, good, 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 good. Well, so how is and everything, and how and is everything in the liberal uh, utopia today, Bob? Yeah. I, right? uh, kinda, kinda, well, what did the prime minister say at first when all this started? Well, what did he say? He said so many things. Uh, well, when no, when, when all of what thing. started, uh, the budget will balance itself. The story in the Globe <laughs> and Mail is false. Uh, he has said so many. The carbon tax will never go above fifty dollars a no, ton. No, I mean, he virus. said a lot of things. Uh, Bob, he said uh, in, in September. I don't know the Kielbergers. I mean, he said a lot of things. No, no, the, I'm talking about the virus. Right? Oh, the virus. Okay. He said yeah. You sure. got, everybody is going to be vaccinated. Vaccinated by September, no, in right? September. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So no, we should no. all just, what, suck it up, right, Bob? And so what if the Americans are months ahead of us? And so what if oh, they're they going to be, them, they make have herd vaccine. immunity in the they UK on Monday? Vaccine. You know, we should, uh, we should all wait until September. And by the way, they don't say, they, they, according to the Bloomberg vaccine tracker, it's not going to be, we're not going to achieve herd immunity until December, Bob, until December. No, no, we're okay? going to make it until September. Right. There's well, no problem. So uh, there's no problem. There's no, no problem. problem. We have 4,200 cases today and 246 oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in Ottawa. There, yeah. And how many people are dying every day? And how many oh, people are going to die? And how many young people are going to die between now and September while we wait for this government to get its act together on vaccines, Bob? We can't get the vaccine. Can't get the vaccine. Well, who was supposed to buy the vaccine? We you know, he's speaking of what the prime minister said, the prime minister said I couldn't swing a cat without hitting somebody who would be <laughs> vaccinated five times over, Bob. The <laughs> prime minister has said a lot of things. But again... Oh, no, you're right enough. Uh, yeah, I know, you say, Rob. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I agree with I know, you, I know. You're in Vanier, Bob. You're in Vanier. You're in Vanier. You're in liberal Vanier, okay, where a ball of lint could run. Yeah, as long as it was a liberal, it would win. So there we go. <laughs> I love that guy. I really do, Bob. Call anytime. Because uh, he gives as good as he gets. Diane. Good morning, Diane. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Yes. Um, I know all the news is kind of bleak and, and, yes, it is. and everything, but 
there was one highlight for me this week. Okay. I went to get my vaccine on Wednesday. My daughter very efficiently got me in. I'm 76, so I was eligible to go. And I had to go to a place in Canada. I can't even remember the community center name. But I have never. I mean, when you're dealing with the government, you usually you just kind of shrug your shoulders. Okay. <laughs> I have never in my life been anywhere that was so efficient oh good so friendly yes. they were just like they blew me away uh, uh. the people out there should absolutely be commended because it was fabulous that's good that's good was so it busy when you were uh, 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 diane 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 I, was sorry. it busy when you were there Oh, yes. Yeah, but Every, everybody was you, busy because you, there have been some columns in the paper this week that uh, some of the places don't seem very busy and people aren't showing up for appointments. Well, the parking so. lots were full. Oh, yeah. I had my time for 831. Then somebody went to the parking lot with a megaphone and called out the number. Twelve right. people went to the door. Twelve people were ushered in. There were 12 places inside to get uh, get your, your vaccination. All the people, you asked anything, they could answer questions. There was good. a rest place. Like, it was just, it was just like clockwork. That's and good. That's so good. just a little bit of, there's a little bit of good news out right, there. Right, when right. you do that, finally yeah. get in, okay. it's fabulous. That's good. That's good. So when do you get your second shot? Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm not talking about the second all shot. All right, about okay. the first all right, all right, okay. Call me in four months. Let me know how it goes there. Okay, thank right, you. Bye, have bye, a good thank weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. Last call, talk back hour for the week. We saved the best for last. Uh, Trevor, Trevor. Hey, how you doing? Good, Trevor. What's up? Uh, I was just calling because uh, I got some people, I listen to your show all the time, and people were complaining about uh, how difficult it was to get a appointment for a vaccination. And... Uh, I'm in one of those hot zones. I don't know why. Okay. But uh, I was listening to your show about a woman kind of, I don't know, I guess she was just going on and on <laughs> about how hard it was. And uh, so I got off the phone and I called. And well, are you talking about the postal codes? Going yeah. by Yeah. Well, I, I think she. what she said was it took her three and a half hours. She was it on hold me, for three and a half hours. So It took me seven minutes. Yeah, well, when, when was that? Today? Today. Yeah, this was, yeah, she didn't do it today. She did it yesterday, so. Oh, okay. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. Today, Who knows? Minutes, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know, Trevor. So when are you, when is your appointment? It's on Monday. On uh, Monday. And, wow. and yeah. then the following one is uh, August 2nd. Okay, good for you. Good for you. Yeah. I hope it goes well for you, sir. Oh, so I. And I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear that that went smoothly. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we, re we report when things go well. I mean, we prefer to report screw-ups because we're in the news. It's better, you know, it's a better news story. Government does things right? Not a great headline. Government screws things up massively? That's the kind of headline we like in the news business. This is the Rob Snow Show, back after the news on City News.
IWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 9th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 18 degrees. Here is what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. It's another record number of cases today in the city of COVID-19 and in the province. 4,227 new COVID cases province-wide and in the city, 246. Other areas around the region not faring much better. Eastern Ontario Health Unit, 64 new cases, 22 more in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, 12 more in Renfrew County. Positive cases come from about 61,400 completed tests. Hot zones continue to have extremely high numbers as well, like 1,218 today in Toronto. Also, 18 more deaths are being blamed on COVID-19 in the province. Premier Ford has received the COVID-19 vaccine. Premier Ford appeared a little squeamish as he rolled up his left sleeve at an Etobicoke shopper's drug mart. I get a little nervous with these needles, but that's all right. It's all good. <laughs> I'll be quick. Oh, okay. That's the bill, sir. But with a quick jab, the pharmacist inoculated the premier with the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Anyone 55 and older in Ontario can get that at a pharmacy. The premier is 56. After he got the shot, the premier stopped to make mention of the passing of Prince Philip. On behalf of the, the, the people of Ontario, we want to give our condolences to Her Majesty, the Queen, and the royal family. Um, Prince Philip was a, a you know a father grandfather, uh, war hero, and uh, he'll be greatly missed. I'm Richard Southern. City News Time, 11.02. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Clouds will increase through the day, but another very warm day for us. A high 22 degrees. Tonight, mainly cloudy and 10, and tomorrow up to 24. Sun and cloud. For Sunday, windy with rain showers. Not quite as warm, but still well above average. The high 18. For today, the high 22. And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 18 degrees. Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, has died at the age of 99. One of just a handful of men in history to be the husband of a reigning British queen. He stamped his own personality on that job with no formal constitutional role. Tom, Tom Rivers has more on Philip, who he says was an energetic man. Philip had a pilot's license and used to fly himself around. He loved horse carriage driving. He was a keen sportsman, playing polo and cricket, shooting, deer hunting and sailing. He also loved to paint. Uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Premier Doug Ford both expressing their condolences online on behalf of the people of the country and the province to the royal family. In Ottawa, flags will be flying at half-mast until uh, Prince Philip's funeral. So far, no date for that just yet. The economy added 303,000 jobs in March, bringing the jobless rate nationally down from 8.2% to 7.5%. That is a pandemic-era low the increase puts employment 296,000 shy of the pre-COVID levels. StatsCan says there were about 95,000 more retail jobs fully recouping losses sustained in January lockdowns. But of course, we are now in an April lockdown. In Ottawa, the rate did go up slightly to 6.3. In Gatineau, it's now 7.3% unemployment rate. National Capital Commission making more space along Ottawa Parkways available for people to get their exercise this weekend. Decision to close some lanes to motor vehicles on the weekend comes as the province imposed that stay-at-home order. And both the westbound lanes of Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway will open for active use 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. Sir George Etienne Cartier Parkway will open 8 to 4 for residents to use between Aviation Parkway and St. Joseph Boulevard in Orleans. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. As we've been reporting, it's the early morning big breaking news story. Prince Philip died this morning, 99 years of age. Passed away peacefully at Windsor Castle. Robert Finch is the chair of the Monarchist League of Canada. Good morning, Mr. Finch. 
Good day, Rob. How are you? Today? I'm okay. Hey, how, are, how are you, sir? What is your rea- What is your reaction to that news? Yeah, you know, listen. I mean, it's obviously sad. I mean, it's always I feel sorry for the Queen. I mean, this was her rock. Um, at the same time, though, it's a, it's a good opportunity to celebrate the the life uh, of uh, of Prince Philip. I mean, he lived a long one, 99 years old. Uh, it's a bit. Uh, it's, a, it's too bad he couldn't have made it to at least 100. But uh, listen, 99 is nothing to sneeze at, right? Tell us. Tell us. Uh, well, let's kind of get get the snapshot of the. I mean, ninety nine. We can't. We can't go through it all. But um, <laughs> Prince Philip, give, tell us about his early life, for example. So he didn't. Have, I mean, he didn't have a great, uh, a great uh, early life. I mean, uh, he, I mean, he of course was born into a uh, uh, the Greek royal family. That being, he has no Greek blood in him at all. But uh, he was born into the Greek royal family. And um, uh, now, when we say royal family, we often think of palaces and everything and whatnot. Have you? It wasn't the case when he was born in the Greek royal family. There wasn't any money at all. Uh, in fact, I think he was born uh, on the table, on a dining room table in, in the, his parents' house. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it was so it was a very modest uh, uh, upbringing, if you will, uh, in, the, in those other days. And then finally, he uh, uh, settled in into the UK and uh, was very uh, uh, started the military career. Uh, was in, a, in his own right there, and then met uh, the Queen uh, at a very young age. I think the Queen was only 13 when they met, so she was still a kid. And how, and, how, uh, how did that yeah. come to pass? Was that arranged by the families? Or? I don't know if it was arranged. I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean the Queen and Prince Philip are, of course, third cousins, so they, 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 there was uh, a family connection there. And uh, they, so they, they met, and... Um, uh, I, I mean, the queen obviously fell fell from the beginning there, mm-hmm. and uh, as as time went on, they they developed a closer relationship, and uh, uh, he eventually um, uh, married uh, the queen, and then uh, his his life obviously took a major uh, change from his um, the modest um, uh, childhood to now a member of the royal family. Uh, and um, yeah. it took, a, it took a little bit of heat as well. Family. I mean, yeah. that's right. And, and he took a little bit of heat, of course, uh, marrying into the, the royal family because of his. Uh, uh, you know, he he, would, he didn't it wasn't overly welcomed by a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people. But uh, listen, he he, he ended up uh, becoming. Um, I think the stalwart of uh, of of the royal family today. He, he's he has been so so important and influential in that institution and in that family. And and why do you say that? Why do you say that? Well, I think as I said, I think I mean honestly, it, it's a, it's a delicate job, right? I mean, right. What, what is the job of the consul? What's the job of the husband of the queen? Because he has absolutely no. There's no constitutional role for him at all. Uh, there's there's a modest ceremonial role to play. His main job really is to be. The, uh, the 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 rock and the partner of the monarch. He has to be able to um, support her, let her do her job. Uh, he's able to bring a little bit of his own uh, his own element into the position, but he, you know he has to walk that fine line. He can't uh, make it about him. It always has to be about the queen. And he he struck that balance, I think, perfectly. I mean, he he was able to. Uh, help modernize the monarchy in a will in a way. I mean, uh, think about it. I mean, we talk about technology, but the early days of the Queen's reign. I mean, the new technology was television, and he was able to see, hey, this is something that we could use to sort of uh, let people see what we do. So he was able to use technology, use his own insight there to help bring the monarchy into. I guess it was the twentieth. <laughs> uh, century there, and uh, and then he was able to ascend. He had his own his own causes that uh, he was passionate about. I mean, it definitely youth. When it came to youth, I mean, he was a strong advocate for young people across uh, Britain, Canada, the Commonwealth. Had the whole Duke of Edinburgh uh, award schemes, uh, big on volunteerism. And then is uh, I mean, we often think about today. I mean, what's a cause that's very important today? It's it's the environment. I mean, Prince Philip was a champion of the environment a long, long, long time, early, early on. Champion and uh, wildlife conservation around the world. Okay. What is his legacy for Canadians, and what is his connection to Canada? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, he, he was very, very connected to Canada. I mean, he was certainly um, uh, the patron of, uh, I think it was like 40 uh, organizations here alone. Uh, so he certainly lent his name to that. Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh Award scheme here was very, uh, was very uh, uh, important for him uh, and uh, whatnot. And, uh, of course, the... Uh, you know, his, he, he came to Canada probably more than any other uh, Commonwealth realm. I mean, he was even here for an overnight stay back uh, when he was, well, well in his 80s. He just came for, a, you know, a, a very short, uh, a short, brief uh, 
uh, visit down to, uh, to Toronto to uh, to uh, uh, for a military connection. So he was very dedicated to his uh, organizations that he was patron to here in this country and through the sort of the general uh, that general sense of volunteerism that uh, that he encouraged. I mean, there are a lot of young Canadians who uh, grew up. Uh, volunteering and doing things good for their their their, their country, their the environment, in the name of the Duke of Edinburgh. So that legacy will live on today, and I think that's what he needs to be remembered for from this side of the uh, this side of the pond. What What do you think about? He has a reputation of being rather uh, <laughs> blunt. I guess blunt, you could blunt's say. Blunt's a good word. Blunt's blunt, a good word. Okay. Um, what, what What do you think about that? I must that, ask you what you think of his. Portrayal in popular culture, um, in particular the Crown Television series. <laughs> there's, 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 there's popular culture, and then there's real life, right? So, okay. I, I mean, Prince Philip had a great sense of humor. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I had the privilege of meeting with him briefly myself a couple of times, and his, his sense of humor was just, was just phenomenal. Um, it, but, yeah, of course, he had, he had a way of saying things, and... Um, Sometimes told it the way he felt and didn't really care. And of course, I'm sure that was much to the uh, to the, um, uh, the 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 yeah. The, the he wasn't politically much. correct. He, he had, wasn't politically no. correct for sure. He was certainly a product of a different era. And I mean, listen, when you're 99 years old, you are a product of a different era. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, he he still uh, he he was still able to perform the role without getting into too too much trouble. Um, because if he, I mean, I mean, your actions speak a lot louder than words. I think, and there's, it's one thing for people to um, uh, say something that's not uh, appropriate, uh, particularly in, in uh, you know, today's uh, in right. today's age. But it's another thing to look at what. Have you done as an as, as your actions? What have, what do you what do you do as an individual? I, I don't think anybody can uh, point to Prince Philip and say that uh, that he didn't do uh, things that were good for everybody, uh, regardless of uh, where they were from or what the background was. Uh, everybody in that sense benefited from him. So I think that's what the you know as opposed to the off the cuff remarks. That's the sort of thing that needs to be uh, put, remembered really for him. I think right. So his legacy really is being the Rock. For Her Majesty, right, and his his legacy of duty and public service, duty. right? Duty and dedication. Duty I mean, and dedication. Seven, I mean, seventy three years married to the Queen. Which yes, is remarkable yes. in its own right when you right. think about it. Yes, and the minute you, the, the, I mean, remember they married when they were married. They were they married. You know, quite young. Only had uh, a few years before they were now thrust into the, uh, the 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 light, the spotlight. That now she was the queen, and all of a sudden you're a young a uh, young husband, and it's like, oh, great, my wife's the queen. Your life changes. Your life changes entirely, and um, a lot of people, a lot of people wouldn't be able to handle that, and would be like, "Oh, I, I, I you know, I, I you know, I would run for sure. the hills, if you will." But sure. here's a guy that stood by his wife and gave her the support for seventy plus years. Pretty remarkable, in my view. Okay, I thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, from the Monarchist League of Canada, uh, chairperson there, Robert Finch. 11-14 sports, not a good week for the Ottawa Senators and, and a, a bad season all around when they play the Edmonton Oilers. They played the Edmonton Oilers nine times, lost every single game. And they're back in action tomorrow against the Toronto Maple Leafs. So we'll talk Sens hockey and round two of the Masters underway now. Take a look at the leaderboard and... Uh, how things could play out this weekend. Steve Warren of the Steve Warren Project and the Sens Nation podcast. Coming right up on the Rob Snow Show on City News. No Nut Butter is a business where we make allergy-friendly spreads. Um, so alternatives to peanut butter, Nutella, or those kind of things that... Kids and adults like to have on toast or on a banana or on apple um, and aren't really available to people with severe food allergies or allergies to the top allergens. When you're an allergy parent, you read every label uh, because you need to know the details of every ingredient that's in the products that you're going to feed your kid. So we found that a lot of the products that we were looking at had may contain warnings, um, which we can't have. Um, and had uh, just so many ingredients in them that you don't know if there's a weird unknown ingredient that is kind of disguised under a different name. 
So um, we started No Nut Butter so that we would have the opportunity to have products that were safe and free from the top allergens and had really simple ingredients in them so that you would know exactly what you were feeding your kids. We make four different products at No Nut Butter. So we make a pumpkin seed butter, which is our alternative to peanut butter. Uh, so it only has pumpkin seeds, roasted pumpkin seeds, and some kind of oil in it. So we usually use corn oil or olive oil. And then we make a, what we call choco pumpkin, and it is our alternative to a chocolate hazelnut spread. So it is our pumpkin seed butter with our chocolate spread, so very much chocolate hazelnut spread. We make a coconut caramel, so it is coconut milk and sugar, and it is our kind of vegan option for caramel, because typically caramel has lots of butter and dairy in it. Uh, and then we make an apple butter, which is apples and cinnamon and sugar, and that's it. We do also make a sugar-free pumpkin seed butter option um, because we have some diabetics and just some people who don't want sugar in their lives, and so we do offer that, but you'd have to custom order it. There are very strict rules around uh, producing products, um, particularly nut-free products. Um, you aren't allowed to cook in your own kitchen, which makes a lot of sense. If you have a dog, you don't want to cook in your own kitchen. But from a nut standpoint, um, it's just making sure that you have everything really clean and organized. So we cook all of our products in a commercial kitchen uh, so that we can keep all of those health and safety procedures really tight and together. <laughs> My personal business started a company called Shop Local Ontario during the pandemic. So we were pretty well equipped to go forward into the pandemic in a world of e-commerce and transacting online. You can find us online at nonutbutter.com or you can find us on Facebook, No Nut Butter, or on Instagram at No Nut Butter. is changing so keep up with rob the rob snow show returns on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 a.m he's the host of the steve warren project the sends nation podcast steve warren back on city news good morning steve good morning rob what did you think of the week for the ottawa senators well i mean the the oilers i think we were glad to see the last of them aren't we Yes. Uh, to go 0-9 against the club, that's just historically bad. I did think they were a lot better in last night's game. They did some good things out there, and the difference in the game uh, was a deflected shot that could easily have ended up in the 15th row somewhere, but in fact ended up uh, uh, going in for the game-winning goal. So a closer game, but uh, yeah, that's the thing that stands out about the week that was, uh, that, uh, that Oiler dominance. Yeah, it's so crazy to go to lose to a team in one season nine times now i'm sure that that must be a byproduct of how crazy the schedule is right 56 games you're only playing other canadian teams it, it, you know it's so unusual right so, well i think it's impossible uh, if you look at the 1967 expansion when it was original six and they moved in uh, six new teams um before that i mean there's uh i mean everything that's happened since then it's impossible because i think you can only play uh, max uh, eight games against a team in any given season. So, um, yeah, I think this has got to be a first to go 0-9 against the club. And uh, it's all very unpredictable stuff, though. I was thinking about it because the Sens have a great record against Montreal. Montreal has a great record against Edmonton, and yet Edmonton <laughs> pile drives Ottawa all yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and Ottawa, you know, Ottawa's going to play Toronto tomorrow night. Uh, Ottawa's played pretty well against Toronto this season, too. So it's... It's weird. It's kind of a head scratcher. But when you watch those two, um, Drysaddle and McDavid, I mean, it's greatness. You're watching greatness uh, as good as good as I've ever seen people on skates. Steve, it's just it's a treat to watch that kind of stuff. Both well, it's hard to imagine that uh, you know McDavid's. I think this is his sixth season in the NHL, fifth or sixth. And to watch McDavid and Drysaddle operate, it's hard to imagine that still McDavid has only been part of one playoff series victory in his time in Edmonton uh, because they just look, especially against the Ottawa Senators, so elite. Like, everybody else looks like they're at a B level and these two guys at an A level. Um, I honestly 
uh, I thought the Sens, for the most part, I mean, I watched all nine games. And, yeah, there were some dominant moments where the Sens didn't show up. Yeah. But every time I thought to myself, if McDavid and Dreisaitl aren't out there, you know, I have a hard time believing the Oilers are much better than the Ottawa Senators. They're just that dominant. Trade deadline uh, just on the Sens is uh, – trade deadline day is Monday, right, for the National Hockey League? Correct. Do you Three expect o'clock. any moves for the Senators? What, what's the anticipation of trade deadline day? Well, I, I would love to for the good listeners out there to say, yes, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be wild. You're going to love it. I really feel like they're at a point in their rebuild where, you know, if, if they're going to be sellers, they don't have a lot of inventory here because yeah. – you think, you know, Pajot last year, yeah. Stone and Duchesne the year before as all part of the sell-off, you know, as Eugene Melnick put it, no one's ever trashed a team the way we have. Well, now, here in 2021 of the deadline on Monday, anything that the Sens have yeah. that another club might be interested in, like a blue-chip prospect or two, just isn't for sale at this yeah. stage in the rebuild. Anybody want a Nisimov? A Nisimov going once, uh, going... Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the thing. And there's all kinds of Nisimovs on this team. Um, like, and, and Ottawa would be willing to part with them, but you're not going to get anything for them. These guys can be had, guys like, you know, Riley and Goodbranson and Coburn, um, with all due respect. Uh, they can be had for not very much. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of deadline I'm expecting. You never know. Maybe a guy like Connor Brown, you know, that's a guy that might garner some interest. I would yell up and down if they even went remotely down that road, but I could see like that type of a player that's, uh, that's serviceable. That would be really a good asset for a Stanley cup contender. If the right thing came along for Pierre Dorian, it's always about that. If some absurdly good, offer comes along maybe you look at it uh, frankly i love connor brown so i'd hate to see it yeah he's playing really well lately too he's uh, i think he has six goals in six games so he, you know, he completely to... does this yeah. is a guy that had nothing but trouble around the net all season long he would be the last guy that i would expect would tie the record for the ottawa senators in consecutive games with a goal drake batherson had six straight earlier in the year uh, and now Connor Brown, of all guys, of all who guys. just was we, – we all knew him as the guy who created so much for himself but squanders so many chances, and yet he's uh, he's the hot hand right now. Okay. Let's turn our attention to the Masters. Uh, I just had the leaderboard up here in front of me, and uh, Justin Rose lit it up yesterday, uh, shooting a 65, 7 under uh, for a four-stroke lead, but now his uh, lead is down to one stroke now. He's uh, – He's two over on his day through six uh, at five under, so one stroke ahead of somebody called Weisberger, 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 I guess. I'm, I'm not sure who that is, but he's at four under, whoever he is. Uh, what have you thought so far of the Masters, Steve? Well, I think the course is the story right now. It was really interesting to hear the, uh, the post-round news conferences with the various players. Like, I heard two different guys compare it to going, you know, 12 rounds with various heavyweight boxers. <laughs> One said Mike Tyson, another said Evander Holyfield. So it was playing as tough as Augusta has ever played, particularly when most of these guys played in the last Masters, which we all know was held back in November, different time of the year, obviously. And then you cruise into Augusta in the month of April, where obviously it is so much warmer and drier um, and now all of a sudden the course plays entirely differently. They, they just tore it up. Remember DJ, or yeah, Dustin Johnson wins the thing in November and he's something like minus 20 something like mm-hmm. record numbers this time around. I mean, Justin Rose was the outlier. Uh, I, I mean, this is a course that can be had if the greens aren't tough and they were not in November, but now here in April, Oh my God, it, it was, it was tearing guys to pieces yesterday and so uh, Justin Rose was one of the guys that was able to you know maneuver around the course really well he had a, a slow start two over par in his first seven and then played the next 10 holes in nine under and that kind of came out of nowhere because uh, he had been dealing with injury and uh, so not only had a tough course but he really wasn't looking like a guy that was going to be among the favorites so good for him for getting it going yeah well, my uh, pick, I picked an outsider to a, a kind of a dark horse in uh, Lee Westwood. So I've blown my pick. He was six over to end the day. Yes, he's not even going to make the cut. So, so much for that, Rob. Um, <laughs> D- 
David's pick was Spieth. He's right there, right? One under. So David's still in the mix, my producer. Uh, who, are, who, are you, who are you picking there, Steve? Well, Spieth is my guy, too, because no, he won last week. Okay. And uh, finally was starting to look good. And I, I still like him because yesterday he was as good as it got as far as approach shots go. He was 16 of 18 on, on approach shots. So if you're hitting greens, uh, you're giving yourself a chance on these ridiculously tough greens. So yeah, that was that was my pick, and I'll and I'll stick with him. And it's going to be interesting to see if some of the rain that they have in the forecast kind of changes the dynamic of the whole thing. I just love the watching the Masters. It's just oh, one of the too. you know, it's just one of those things. Uh, just part of the tradition. It's great to have it back, and uh, it looks great. <laughs> it does look great on television. As well, good we're as in a stay-at-home order. What do you want? Exactly I mean, right. Yeah, exactly. That's perfect. Yeah, it's so much better this time around. At least there's sports to watch. You remember this time last year was pretty much a sports desert. Uh, just curious. we got about two minutes left here, I guess. Um, have you watched any of the Jays yet, uh, so far this season uh, at all? Yeah, I've, wa- I've yeah. watched a little bit. I haven't watched it as closely as uh, I do some years for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, they, yep. they, they look like they're a team that, uh, you know, that, that is going to be, as I mentioned in, in last week's uh, discussion, that uh, will be a wild card team. I still feel good about that based on their start. It's that batting order that's that's just terrific up and down. I think they're going to have a great offensive year, and then you've got uh, you've got a pitching staff that's off to a, an okay start as well. So, you know who yeah, I so far. Yeah, I, I'm I'm just you know it's kind of a, a, a new season. I'm still getting acquainted with some of the the players, but the person so far has really impressed me is the closer Merriweather. I mean, wow, he's he can fire it in there, 98, yeah. 99 miles an hour. Very impressive. Very, they they have to get it to him so he can get the save. But uh, uh, I really like him. So you know. the guy I liked was uh, that I'm encouraged by was uh, just based on his first start anyway was uh, the guy they brought over from the Mets in January because you know after their after their gunner they don't really have uh, you know a real bona fide number two starting pitcher and Steven Matz may be there that uh, that guy you know there's a guy from the mm-hmm. Mets that. Has World Series experience, still a young guy, 29, good lefty. And so that's the guy that I'm going to kind of keep an eye on in the early going as far as the pitching staff goes. But you're right. I mean, you're not going anywhere unless you have an ace in the bullpen. Well, you got uh, the Sens and the the Maple Leafs tomorrow night and the Masters this weekend. So uh, I know what you're doing. (laughs) Exactly. Your your weekend is taken care of, Steve. Yeah, I'll be on the, if anybody needs me, I'll be on the couch covered in chip crumbs. <laughs> Thank you, Steve Warren. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye. Steve Warren of the Steve Warren Project. On all your podcasting platforms. Hey, we're back after the news with the Queen's Park Week in Review. Should be a hot one. It's coming right up on City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, the 9th of April. Good morning, I'm Sarah Buck, and right now in Ottawa, mainly sunny skies and 20 degrees, mainly sunny and 20 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. Ottawa Public Health appears to have updated its uh, COVID-19 figures for today and reports 242 new cases of COVID-19 and one new death in the capital due to the virus. Active cases are now over 2,000 in the city, 2,023 with 71 people in hospital and 24 people in ICU. Those are new high benchmarks uh, for this pandemic. The province reporting 4,227 new cases of COVID-19. That's the biggest number in the pandemic uh, without a data error. Uh, the province is also reporting 18 more deaths due to the virus. Hospitalizations, patients in intensive care, vented patient numbers continue to soar in Ontario. 1,492 hospitalizations, 552 patients in intensive care, and of those, 359 are on ventilators. Elsewhere locally, Leeds Grenville Lanark Health Unit reporting 23 new cases, eight of those in the last 24 hours. There are 64 new cases in eastern Ontario. 12 new cases in Renfrew County. Ontario hospitals are being instructed to ramp down elective surgeries and non-urgent procedures in order to treat a growing number of COVID patients. Ontario Health President and CEO sent a memo last night instructing hospitals to make the move to preserve critical care and human resources starting Monday. Uh, the memo uh, from the body that oversees the province's health system is also asking hospitals to identify staff who may be redeployed to other sites if necessary. And people are laying daffodils at the gates of Buckingham Palace following the news that Prince Philip died this morning at the age of 99. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said Britain is a kingdom united in both grief at Philip's passing and gratitude for his decades of selfless service to the country. The Queen's husband of more than 70 years was the longest serving consort in British history. She once publicly paid tribute to him during their golden anniversary, calling her, him her rock and her stay. I'm Sarah Buckin for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns. On Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM. And 1310 AM. It's time for Queen's Park Week in Review. And the gang's all here. Three MPPs. Three parties. Goldie Gamari from the riding of Carleton from the Progressive Conservative Party. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Nice to hear you, uh, Goldie. Uh, Gilles Bissab, a new Democrat from Timmins. Good morning, Jill. Good morning. And uh, John Fraser, Ottawa South Liberal. John. Good morning, Rob. Everybody's okay? Yep. Uh, new big time case count today 4,227. 4,227. Uh, 246 is a new record for the uh, Ottawa area. A dozen cases in Renfrew, Eastern Ontario Health Unit 64, Leeds Grenville 22. I mean, it's up, up, up and away when it comes to COVID-19. And now there's a new stay-at-home order in effect, new state of emergency declared uh, this week. And a lot of uh, a lot of heat for Premier Ford, uh, Goldie Gamari, that he waited too long to bring in the latest stay at home order. Did the premier wait too long to do that? Uh, I don't believe so, Rob. I mean, if you look at the numbers and if you look at the modeling, the decision that the premier made um, a couple of weeks ago uh, was based on the, the modeling at the time. However, from March 28th to April 5th, the number of COVID-19 hospitalized, hospitalized uh, my apologies, hospitalizations in the province increased by over 28%. And that 28% increase was much worse than what the modeling predicted. And so that's why the Premier is very nimble and very flexible and very quick in responding. And when the Premier saw that things were deteriorating worse than what the modeling projected, that's when he acted swiftly to implement the stay-at-home order. Things were worse than predicted, and that's why we responded when we did. Okay, uh, Jill, uh, go ahead, Jill. Why don't you jump Nibble in there? And quick, I Nibble would and quick, uh, Muhammad candle Ali, sticks. For darn yeah. sure. Okay, all right. Uh, listen, uh, it's not just the New Democrats that have been saying this for a while. 
their own health experts, their own command table, had been warning the government that they were lifting some of those restrictions too quickly and some of the actions that needed to be taken, such as paid mm-hmm. sick days and other things that we've talked about on the show, uh, needed to be done, and they weren't being done. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty well what you know people predicted may very well happen. Nobody wants this to happen. There's nobody no, no, no. on this no. planet that wants to see what's going on now, but it's not as if we didn't see this coming. And, you know, I I, I don't fault the government entirely. The government's done some things right. But on on trying to do this, they didn't pick a lane. Uh, They tried to be on both sides of the issue at the same time, respect their constituents and uh, those that are anti-maskers and opposed to lockdowns. Uh, You know, they were worried to move in that direction. But the one thing I've learned in politics in 31 years is that you have to pick a lane, and that's what you're paid to do. Pick a lane. Okay. Pick okay. A lane. Uh, John, your reaction, please. Well, yeah. No, I'm, you know, the, I, he, I, he, he, the government's line is, it seems to me, we've lost gold leash. She's going to call back yeah. just to, we're getting a better uh, phone line here. Um, yeah. Is, you know, the situation evolved and the government is evolving with this as, as the situation uh, evolves. John, well, go ahead. I, yeah. 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 Thanks, Rob. Look, no, they, they didn't accurately enough. You know, the, the, you know, everybody has been telling the government what the risks were. And uh, you you can't be a step behind this virus or actually in step with it because it will run in front of you. You have to be ahead of it. So the measures are, are short by at least a couple of weeks, and it's been consistent. And it seems to me in the last two situations at Christmas time and now, it's taken Ontario's doctors, Ontario's nurses, the hospital association, their own science table, three public health this time around, three public health officers to say you need to do that, like literally have warned them and warned them and then literally have to, um, I don't want to say scream at them, but had to tell them in a very loud voice, you need to change the direction. You're not listening to us. And then the government reacts. The problem is the virus is like, you look at it now, look at what's happening in Ottawa. And and I'm really concerned because it's not leveling off. It's well, we had a and new record today, happen. John. New yeah. record in Ottawa well, and today. And if you take a look at the wastewater, what's happening, um, it's going up. And so there's a lot of risk out there for people. And, and you know, people are, you know, fatigued. Uh, and, and I know they're tired about this, the stay-at-home order, but we have to do it. Like, now it's actually up to us. It, it, it's not anything that, you know, the thing that's going to change us is not the government doing something that's going to magically change it. We actually have to follow the stay-at-home order and not do the things that. So, so I, I just want to get. I, I just, so, just so I understand where both New Democrats and Liberals are going. You're saying well, he waited too long. Yeah, yeah. They, the, what the they should have... were there at the beginning. The the medical officers, the health, the command table. All right, okay. Well, let's let let's let Goldie Gamari respond to that. You waited too long. Oh, I'm but, sorry. Yeah. I'll wait for. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, um, Goldie. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. again, I disagree that we waited too long because we are acting on a daily basis. We are getting updated data on a daily basis. Um, I can tell you that as a caucus, you know, we get updated, we get briefings, we get all the health modeling data from, uh, you know, Ontario's top doctors. Uh, we, we look at all this information. So this is a constant thing that we are doing. And we are always taking swift action and swift responses based on what the doctors are telling us and based on what um, Ottawa Public Health it's recommending that we do. So for uh, you know the NDP and the Liberals to come out and say that we have uh, lowered restrictions against the advice that we're given is 100% untrue. Everything no, uh, Goldie, had, go everything talk to your own people. that we have made has been based <laughs> on the recommendations that are being provided by Ontario's top mm-hmm. doctors, as well as recommendations being provided specifically by Ottawa Public Health. The Premier has spoken with Dr. Vera Etches directly on several occasions, okay. and he has always said that he takes her advice and her recommendations very seriously. Okay, so let I, I, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I have, want to say it's I have a question here, that it's come to this point, yeah. but no? you have to continue to be flexible. Okay, continue to be flexible. Uh, John, you said you had a question, just, John. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. Vera, sure. uh, so, so, Goldie, if you listen to Dr. Etches, why would she have to write a public letter with three other medical officers of health pleading with the province to shut down? Including the mayors of all kinds of communities who did exactly the yeah. same. Yeah, The government like, hasn't been listening. That's the whole point. And their own command table has told you this. And you're saying we're lying? I, I'm sorry, Goldie, that's a bit of a stretch. 
John, yep. you were there at the technical briefing last week when we had a technical briefing, all Ottawa area MPCs and federal MPCs and city councillors, along with Mayor Jim Watson mm -hmm. and Dr. Vera Etches. So how can you say that the government's not listening when Minister McLeod and Minister Marilee Fullerton have been organizing technical briefings for local Ottawa politicians? I, I, you know what? I'm, uh, we had a technical briefing. What I'm saying to you is We've the advice that's being given to you, you're not paying attention to, <clears throat> and you're not making the decisions quickly enough. You can brief, you know, uh, Jill and I and everybody else okay. as much as you like. It's about making the decision. And it's very public what the science table has told you. It's very public what medical officers of health told you. Hospital associations, doctors associations, nurses associations. I don't know, Jill, do you want to add any more? Well, the, 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 that's exactly the story, though, is that all of the experts have been saying from... Uh, from the time of this, I guess it'd be the second or third wave, starting after December, that this thing was going to get worse, that the government was lifting the restrictions too quickly. Some of the restrictions were not properly applied. There's a lot of uh, expert opinion who told you that you were doing the wrong thing. Now, I, I said at the beginning, not everything that the government does is wrong. Some of the things that they've done is okay. But when it comes to listening to the opinion of those people who know best, to do what needs to be done, we find ourselves in a situation, quite frankly, uh, because we didn't listen. With respect, yes, we made our decision based on the modeling that was provided to us by Ontario's top experts. The reason that we have now implemented stricter measures is because the numbers have increased more fact. drastically than what was in the modeling that was predicted. Okay. And as soon as no, we realized, as soon as we got updated information that the situation mm -hmm. was worse than what was predicted, we immediately, right away, implemented stricter measures. Okay. I just want to jump in here, if you don't mind, uh, just because we have some new information about the situation here in Ottawa. Um, 74 people in are in Ottawa hospitals now. There are 24 people in intensive care. Those are both all-time highs for the city. Uh, Ottawa Public Health, we get kind of two sets of numbers. We get a provincial number in the morning, and then a little later in the day, we get a, the number from Ottawa Public Health, which says the case count for today is 242. The earlier number was 246. Whatever it is, it's still a record. So um, that's from our newsroom. Ottawa.citynews.ca for all the uh, latest information there. I just wanted to, I just wanted to jump in there. So we're going to play a clip. Okay, um, this is from yesterday. Premier Ford is really, and I can understand his frustration because he's really taken a lot of heat for a program that, if it's flawed, it's the federal government that screwed it up, in my opinion, and that's my been my opinion from the start on paid sick days. Um, but let's play the clip from. Uh, premier yesterday. Well, Ellie, before we, we take questions, I, I want to address something about the uh, paid, paid sick days. You know, my message to to the opposition and everyone else, because there's a lot of one, a lot of people that are uh, playing politics right now, and it's totally irresponsible. They're doing a disservice to the people that they're telling this to. There's paid sick leave from the federal government. And I want to thank the Prime Minister for mentioning that yesterday at his press conference. It's greatly appreciated. So far, 300,000, that's 300,000 Ontarians have accessed the program already. All right, all right. So, so to all yeah, the opposition yeah, and everyone... Yeah, he, he is accusing the opposition of uh, of playing political games, Jill, and I want Democrats. I want your reaction to that, Jill. Bisson. That would be New Democrats. He's accusing New Democrats of playing politics. Right. Yeah. Well, are you? Been, are you? Are you? Look, if this program is screwed up, it's a federal government help. program. Why are why are you why why are you putting the pointing the finger at Mr. Trudeau? Because because okay? the, the federal program is only part of the solution. The reality, and you don't have to listen to me and Andrew Horvath or John Fraser. The reality is, is that the experts uh, in the medical field, uh, the OMA, the mayors, uh, medical officers of health and others are saying people cannot afford to take time off given the, mm -hmm. what the federal government pays in sick leave. Then maybe the federal government should pay more. For the, for, yeah, but the amount <laughs> of money you get on sick leave. Would you choose to go on unemployment insurance no. or would you choose to stay working? You make far less money 
on, on sick leave and you can't pay your bills that is provided by the federal government. And that's why we said there needs to be a temporary program, right. not a permanent program. Right. So because Mr. Trude- so program. because Mr. Trudeau's government screwed up this program because well, it doesn't pay enough more, and it's and it's too heavily bureaucratic and there's a de- and and there's a delay. Uh, that's uh, somehow Premier Ford, that's Premier Ford's fault? Because we have the ability as a province to be able to offer paid sick leave during the COVID pandemic that is paid by the employer and reimbursed and then by you, the province. Then the, yeah, okay. So, that, right, so right. that at the end, it's not a burden to the employer. The employer gets back their money, and that the employee can go I love home this. and they can isolate. I love this. The Trudeau, uh, the Trudeau government messes it all up, and somehow it's Doug Ford's fault. Yeah. It's well, incredible. Listen, it, John, it, Fraser. It, okay, John Fraser. John Fraser. John Fraser. John Fraser. Go ahead. John Fraser. John... <laughs> Come on, John. You okay, you probably case, have the all, prime minister's all. phone number on on your phone on speed dial. Yeah, Why yeah. can't you call and, him up and, and just and, tell him fix this thing, Justin? And, and so Come on. Here, let's, so first of all, Doug Ford likes to take credit for a program that last June he said he didn't want. He wanted to spend the money on something else because he thought Ontario's workers were already protected enough. Premier Ford took away two paid sick days from every employee in Ontario in, Ju- in July, August of 2018. And here's what I want you to imagine. And I know this because I can remember working in a low-wage job at, 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 with a young family. And, you know, we lived paycheck to paycheck, and we depended on it for the food and the rent. And so you wake up one morning, and you're not feeling great. So here's your decision. Either you go to work sick, or you forego that money that you need that will be on your next paycheck. Right. The federal right. program only kicks in, only kicks in, number one, if, you, if, if you've lost half a week's wages or if you had a COVID diagnosis right. or you have to isolate. So if you're not sure, right, it's a pretty big gamble if you're living paycheck to paycheck. So yeah. we're forcing people I to know. make that decision. I know. It's a very so poorly designed it. program, which is why Mr. Trudeau no, should be taking no, the heat and not Mr. No. Ford. Number one, if he hadn't taken away those two paid sick days, he would have eliminated a massive well, yeah, in Ontario during this pandemic, he took them away. There was no good reason to take them away. And even last well, June, was... he thought that was OK. All right. OK. Goldie Gamari. Quickly, Goldie Gamari. I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to talk some sense into them, Goldie Gamari, but it's not <laughs> go. I'm not getting very far this week. Well, I mean, I can know because we're pretty sensible. You ask, uh, <laughs> I can answer the question you asked Gilles with respect to why he's uh, not pointing the finger at uh, Mr. Trudeau. The reason he's not pointing the finger at Mr. Trudeau is he's not going to be campaigning against Mr. Trudeau in the next election. And I just think it's incredibly unfortunate. (laughs) Goldie, you guys campaign against Trudeau all the time. What are you talking about? It's incredibly irresponsible (laughs) to to play with people's lives like this. Uh, All of have a responsibility to inform their constituents about this program and to inform them about how to access this program. We have over $750 million left for people to access paid sick sick leave. And with respect to the issues um, that the federal government Mm -hmm. have uh, admitted to, our minister and our government has been working with the federal minister and the federal government to improve the program that exists because it is a good program. It provides good money. It supports people. And on top of that, we are here to protect people's jobs. We implemented um, job legislation uh, that would protect people and protect workers if they need to take time off to get the vaccine, if they have to take time off to isolate, if they have to take take time off to protect various, uh, you know, family members or children who are dealing with COVID. So we have done and we will continue to do everything we can to support the people of Ontario, okay. to support okay. workers. Gotcha, to support gotcha, gotcha. We'll stop here. We'll stop here. When we come back, when we come, when we come back, we can debate the, the how the vaccine program is going. I'm sure everybody agrees it's going very well. 1149, <laughs> Queen's Park, we can review. Uh, Rob Snow Show, City News. It started out with a small outdoor booth in what was called Artist Alley, which is actually the area just outside our store on William Street, uh, where for a couple of years we sold uh, our jewelry uh, directly on the street. And then we slowly evolved to having an indoor uh, location in this building, 55 Barwood Market Square. We then moved to another location in Place de Ville and then moved back down here on Dalhousie Street at Eargear in the 90s and then back into this building again in, uh, in 2000 as a collection. 
I do a collection of jewelry called Cirque that's uh, mainly uh, beaded work with a combination of semi-precious and uh, vintage beads. And then she does a hat collection uh, called Fanfreluche that's all cut and sewn hats in a variety of fabrics and for uh, all of the seasons of the year. We've curated and sourced the artisans that we represent in a lot of different ways over the years since it's been, you know, uh, since 1985. Uh, some people come to us since we're known and uh, other artisans that we represent might uh, recommend that they come and see us. Uh, some people we find at craft shows or we see uh, their work, somebody wears it in and we go and track it down and bring it. And then some people, interestingly, are with us in one medium and then sometimes they evolve to another. They're all Canadian and mainly local. Um, with the roughly 50 people that we have, I'd say more than half of those are Ottawa Gatineau and then the rest are from other uh, cities in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, um, Vancouver, etc. If you can afford it, go to a small business and spend some money. It's lovely when you come in and, you know, give me a pep talk and tell me how much you love this place and you've been coming here for years. But if you can afford it, please spend some money too because all the pep talks in the world are not going to pay my rent, which is still full rent even when we're closed. Then secondly, if you can't afford to spend money, follow the businesses that you want to support on social media. Go to their Instagram, go to their Facebook, follow their Twitter, and then retweet. Uh, share their Facebook page, like and comment because if you can't afford to, as many of us can't right now, to do extra expenditures, doing all of those little things like that will raise the visibility of those small businesses and hopefully for them result in some online or curbside or other uh, business for them. of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, so we only have five, maybe six minutes, so we got to get right back into it. John Fraser, Liberal. She'll be on the Democrat, Goldie Gamari, Progressive Conservative. It's Queen's Park Week in Review. Uh, the government side has always said we can do 150,000 doses a day. All we need is the supply. Uh, it's been above 100,000 now for the last few days, and it was, what was it, 105,000 today, David? Yes, I'm getting the thumbs up. 105,000 vaccine doses administered in the last 24 hours. How would you describe the vaccine rollout right now, Gilles Bisson? Well, listen, we still got to do more. Uh, part of the problem is supply. Uh, we need to make sure that we get the supply necessary to be able to vaccine, uh, vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. It is confusing for a lot of people. I can tell you in my constituency, that's the phone call that tops all the phone calls that I get when it comes to, uh, for example, AstraZeneca is supposed to be available at our shop, Shoppers Drug Mart. Uh, people registered, but it turns out that the vaccine has not been shipped to northern pharmacies yet. Uh, so people are going, well, what's going on? Uh, the other part of it is, is when it comes to our public health unit, who are doing the best that they can, uh, it is still confusing for some because uh, people that are immune suppressed, uh, et cetera, et cetera, rules are given provincially, and I understand why we need to change them regionally to a degree, but it does cause some confusion. Okay, John Fraser. Yeah, um, Rob, you know, I think it's good now that we're up over 100,000 vaccines, and, you know, we struggle with getting vaccines into their terms yeah that started at the beginning of this whole vaccine rollout yeah so uh, because of the variants you know i think that you know the government's you know announced that they were making plans to get vaccines to um hot spots to certain essential workers and um you know i i think that's the right strategy um we have to do more in that regard we should have been more ready for that um but the thing i, I really do want to say about the vaccine is um look if you can get a shot Get it. Yeah. It's oh, a sure. really important yeah. thing to yeah. do. Yeah. We, we, we need to do that. 
there have been struggles in some but don't areas. But uh, don't, uh, yeah. don't you think both of your parties were trying to make a mountain out of a molehill when you kept saying to the guy, There's all, there are all these doses and freezers, doses and freezers. Why are there so many well, doses and freezers? Well, there, yeah, there, 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 were some, there were real challenges, actually right at the beginning. Right at the beginning, we weren't getting the vaccines into long-term care homes. We were two weeks behind every other province. And that, I think that those are legitimate right. uh, criticisms. You know, there is a rollout to things. But, you know, you got to be ready. And what my point or the whole point is the government hasn't been ready to do the things that they needed to do. Okay. We're too slow. All right. Let's hear from Goldie Gamari on the, the, the government's vaccine so, okay, program. With okay. To, to John's point about us being two weeks behind other provinces, well, logistically, we are the most populated province in Ontario. We have more long-term care homes than any other province. So if you're comparing us to, I don't know, PEI, uh, John, I don't think that's quite fair. But actually, the other Quebec thing has more. is that we actually had uh, all of our long-term care homes vaccinated ahead of schedule. And that's a fact. So to say that we were two weeks behind is, again, just you playing were. politics because we were actually ahead of schedule with our vaccination. No. We need, wanted to make sure the people whose lives were most at risk were protected. Okay. And now what we're doing is we're targeting the hotspots and we're getting as many people vaccinated as possible. And that includes in Ottawa. And I just want to uh, make a quick plug um, to anyone who's listening. Uh, we have three hotspots in Ottawa right now um, that are uh, uh, people over the age of 50 are eligible to get their vaccine at community clinics. And those postal codes are the ones starting with K1T, K1V, and K2V. So if you live in one of those postal codes and you're over the age of 50, please, I urge you to, to go online either on, on uh, the Ontario website or Ottawa Public Health and book your vaccination. And yeah, right yeah. now... Well, part of, yeah, okay. And that's yeah. good information. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. what we Goldie is saying. Yeah. We only have 30 seconds. We only have 30 uh, seconds. I was just going to say it's not the same across okay. the province. Is that we've been waiting for AstraZeneca in our pharmacies in northern Ontario. We asked the questions to the minister the other day at committee. Uh, still no AstraZeneca to be found, and people are frustrated okay. Gotta go. because they've registered and nothing's happening. Got to go. Got to go. We're shipping them. Got to go. Got to go. Got to go. Stay safe, Thanks, everyone. Bro. Stay safe. Thank you. Okay. Stay Thank you for the work that you're day. doing. Bye bye. Bye bye. That's our MPP panel. Queen's Park Week in Review. Goldie Gamari. She'll be signed, John Fraser. I'm Rob Snow. Back on Monday after the nine o'clock news. Mark Sutcliffe coming up with the Mark Sutcliffe Show here on City News. Call the Rogers TV Viewer Response Line.